Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the seventh meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask everyone please to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent? No apologies have been received, um, and I'd like to move straight on to agenda item one, which is subordinate legislation. Uh, this is to do with the National Bus Concession Scheme. Now, there are one or two members that would like to make uh, voluntary declarations of interest. Um, and I think I'm going to start with Stuart. Um, I, I do have in my register of interests that I'm the uh, honorary president of the Scottish Association of Public Transport, and on a voluntary basis, I might be thought to have an interest in that I am a holder and user of a bus pass. Uh, John Mason. I also have a bus pass. pass. <laughs> uh, Peter. I say I'm a proud owner of a bus pass as well. Okay. Well, we've got the. Uh, sorry, Richard. I've, yes, uh, sorry. I, I also uh, own a bus pass, but very rarely use it. Okay. Thank you. So we, we've identified those who have bus passes. So, and the consideration is of one affirmative instrument as detailed in the agenda. We're going to take evidence from the Minister of Transport and Islands, and the motion seeking the improvement will be considered item two. Um, I, I should ask the committee to note that there have been no representations to the committee on this interest. So, and I'm going to welcome now uh, Hamza Youssef, the Minister for Transport and the Islands. Tom Davey, the Head of Bus and Local Transport Policy Unit within Transport Scotland. And Gordon Hanning, the Head of Concessionary Travel and Integrated Ticketing Unit. Minister, would you like to make an, a short opening statement? Uh, I will thank you, convener, and to all those with bus passes, I'm pleased to say we will be keeping them. Um, good morning, uh, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me to discuss the National Bus Travel Concession Scheme for Older and Disabled Persons Scotland Amendment Order 2018. The order sets the reimbursement rate and cap level of funding for the National Concessionary Travel Scheme in 2018-19. In doing so, it gives effect to an agreement that we reached in January with CPT, the Confederation for Passenger Transport, which represents the bus industry. The agreement was based on a reimbursement economic model that was developed on, in 2013 on the basis of independent research commissioned by the Scottish Government and following extensive discussion with CPT uh, and their advisors. Uh, with CPT and our respective advisors, we've reviewed and updated the model and the forecasts and indices used in, used in it during 2017, and we've used this as a basis for the proposed terms for 2018-19. The proposed reimbursement rate in 18-19 is set at 56.8% of the adult single fare. Uh, we believe this rate is consistent with the aim set out in the legislation establishing the scheme that bus operators should be no better or no worse off as a result of participating in the scheme. Uh, it is only marginally different from last year's rate of 56.9%, which will provide a welcome degree of stability for bus operators. On the basis of this reimbursement rate and our expectation for future journey numbers and fares, we forecast that claims for reimbursement will come to 202.1 million over the next year. The figure is reflected in the draft order as the budgetary cap. The order is limited to the coming year. Our work to update the model during 2017 identified a significant uncertainty around what should be the impact of changes in the relative level of the adult single fare. We agreed with CPT that we would leave this element of the model unchanged for 1819, but agreed to return to the matter during 2018 to inform next year's negotiations. The committee will also be aware that we've recently consulted on ways in which to ensure the longer term sustainability of the National Concessionary Travel Scheme on the implementation of our commitment to extend free bus travel to young modern apprentices and whether to provide companion cars for disabled uh, people uh, under five. Uh, the consultation closed in November 2017, having attracted almost 3,000 responses. Uh, these have been analysed and a summary report and individual responses will be published in the coming weeks. Uh, we will, of course, also be sending our, our response to the consultation. Uh, in conclusion, uh, convener, we know that older and disabled people greatly value the free bus travel that the scheme provides, which enables them to access local services, visit friends and relatives and gain from the health benefits of a more active lifestyle. Uh, the order provides for those benefits to continue for a further year on a basis that is fair to operators and, of course, affordable to taxpayers. I commend the order to the committee and, of course, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we have questions. I'm going to start with uh, Mike and then go to John. Mike. 
Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Um, just looking at the figure of £202.1 million pounds that's in the SSI, um, looking at the budget um, booklet that we were all given and when we just voted through the budget, concessionary fares and bus services, the budget is £269.1 million, And I was just wondering um, where the other £67 million pounds in the budget is gone or is going? Uh, BSOG is the largest part of that, the bus service operator grant, which we use to, to subsidise. Uh, the bus industry, uh, and an element of that will also be financial transactions, and so we might use that, for example, the bus abatement scheme in, the, in, in relation to making buses cleaner uh, and greener. But I can get a d detailed breakdown uh, if he wishes and, that, and write to him. But the vast majority of that uh, will be the, the bus service operator grant. That would be very helpful if you could get a breakdown in sure. writing. Sure. Um, could submit to the clerks a breakdown of, of the budget figure. Um, of course. That would be very helpful. Could, could I continue? Yeah, sorry, Mike. Um, yeah. yeah, could I ask, the £202.1 million, pounds, um, you say it's not very much different from, from previous years, has the, that's, that's a limit, that is a, um, that's a limit that can't be breached, if, if, isn't it? So has, has the limit come anywhere close to being breached in previous years? Yes, I mean, we have, again, I can send them this table if, if you would find it useful, but I have the figures from 2006 right the way through to the present day of, of what the budget cap was and what the scheme payments ended up being. And there's some variation and obviously we forecast. So mm -hmm. uh, if we take this financial year that's coming, we're forecasting to be just about at the limit of, 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 of that cap. Um, and in previous years, when I look, uh, you know, if I look at 16, 17, for example, uh, it came in under the cap. I look at 17, 18, as I say, we're, we're forecast to come uh, around about bang on the cap. Uh, if I look at 15, 16, it came under the cap. But then I look at other years, uh, I can find years where it came in, uh, payments came in above the cap. So uh, there is some variation, and that is a forecast. Uh, as a model that is agreed with CPT, but if the member would find it helpful, I'm sure we can give them figures for, uh, for example, the past 10 years of, of what the budget cap was and what the actual uh, payments were. That's very helpful. The reason I ask this is that I've had a meeting with the, with the bus operators, and they tell me that um, because this limit can't be breached, there's no incentive. In fact, not only is there no incentive, apparently they're not being encouraged to advertise the use of... Um, the concessionary cards that people have to encourage greater bus use. And if the objective of the Scottish Government is to increase bus use, and I noticed for the first time it's gone below the four million level of uh, bus journeys, if the, if, the, if the policy is to encourage bus use, greater bus use, and the uh, finance is capped at 202 million and a budget of 269 million, um, and the bus users are saying they would like to advertise the use, for people to use the concessionary cards to get more travel, but they seem to, well, they certainly indicated to me, and I would like to know whether this is true or not, whether the Scottish Government actually has a policy of saying to them, don't encourage the use of the concessionary card, don't advertise it. Um, what's, what's, sure, what's C certainly no policy exists like that at all. There's no direction would you, from the Would you Scottish be happy government. if they did Yes, uh, I would be, of course. And this is why we've got a consultation on the longer-term sustainability of it. Just on the cardholders' point, you know, it's worth having the figures in front of me here. That In 2006 7 um, there was 900,000 uh, cardholders. There's now 1.3 million or above 1.3 million cardholders. So we are seeing an increase. And we have, over the last decade uh, plus, uh, seen an increase in cardholders, which is positive. So I don't think it bears out in the figures. And again, we can provide the member but, but, but you're not, with the you're, you're not worried, uh, and there's absolutely no concern from Yes, the I, I, I want to address that they, point. If they advertise it. No, I've got no concern of them advertising that at all. But the point he makes, and, and operators have made to him, is a fair one. There is a concern around the longer-term sustainability of it. We know well, and this committee knows well, that we have an, 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 an ageing uh, population, an ageing demographic, as, as most of Western Europe uh, does. Uh, and therefore, we have to find a balance between making this scheme fair uh, realising the benefits of it and making it, of course, sustainable in the long term. And that's why we have had the consultation. That's why it garnered probably 3,000 people uh, contributing to it because of the vast interest in it. Uh, and we do have to look at that sustainability. Now, I've said in my opening remarks that uh, we'll publish the analysis of that consultation in the coming weeks and then the government's response to that uh, as well. So when the operators say they have concerns around perhaps the sustainability of it because of the budget cap or anything else, 
I don't think that's unfounded. I think I can appreciate the fact that they would have that. Uh, but I would say to him that the consultation aims to try to, to see how we can make that scheme sustainable in the long term. Uh, John, um, then uh, Stuart, and then uh, Colin. The convener. Um, to ask about the reimbursement, the, I mean, on a recent day, I used the bus six times. So if that was six single fares, that would be about £13 in Glasgow. And if the company's getting 56%, that'd be about seven pounds. So they're getting seven pounds that day. If, if I'd bought an all day ticket myself, it would have been four pound 50. So they appear to be making a profit. Is that taken into account when the percentage reimbursement is fixed? As I mean, uh, I think again, I said in my, my, my statement in 2013, you know, we agreed to, to review the model. Um, and we've been looking at reviewing it ever since. Now, I have to appreciate the dynamics at play here where the bus operators somewhat understandably will look to, to defend their position. Uh, and we'll also uh, do our best, of course, to get the best value for the taxpayer. And in that, we've seen again from, if I take 2006-07, uh, the beginning of, of the scheme, that 73.6% was the was the reimbursement rate. Uh, and we've now got it down to 568 which is, of course, a good deal for, for, for the taxpayer. But what I would say is that... Uh, We've agreed to remain consistent on the adult single fare for this financial year, but throughout 2018, I'll be reviewing that uh, and looking into that. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at um, what possible or potential changes we might make uh, for, for 1920, because there are issues, I think, around um, other fares, uh, and I think it's only right that we, we explore them. So um, I can promise them that it's absolutely part of our consideration this, this year in 2018. Um, but clearly, it has to be a, a, a negotiation, a com almost a compromise, a discussion with the bus operators. Just one other point, kind of on that. I mean, I think some of the companies now are, have to get two levels of single fare because one is if you turn up, and one is if you buy it and have it on your phone. Uh, I assume it's the high <coughs> rate that's being used. Yeah, I'll double check, but I'd, I'll, with Gordon maybe to come in on that. No, it's, it's quite a new um, development that, and, and they're actually in discussion with the bus company. We've got one president, um, which is with, with Megabus and CityLink, who have always had fares that are much higher if you turn up on the day compared to if you book in advance offline. And, and we worked out a, a formula that sort of recognised that both uh, positions were valid. So this has been quite a recent advent, mobile phone-based fares that are a bit cheaper than the, 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 the pay-with-cash fare. So we're actually in the middle of, of discussions with the, I think there's three bus companies who are in that position at the moment, and we're discussing with them. But certainly our view is that having already set a precedent that it shouldn't be the highest fare, yeah. it should be some uh, mix that represents the, the, the mix of the two fares. I expect that's what will happen. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Colin, I think you're going to do the last question. There's no one else indicated. So, Colin, if I could ask you to... Thank you. <coughs> Thanks very much, Convener. I know the Minister said that the bus pass would stay, but he never gave me any guarantee when I reached the same age as my older colleagues here at 60. I'll, uh, I'll have access to a bus pass, but I'm sure we'll see the results of that soon. C can I just follow up um, on the question on fares? Um, the, the, by setting the, uh, the, the rate a percentage of an adult fare, do you agree that that actually is an incentive to bus companies to keep adult fares high? Because obviously, by definition, they'll receive a higher percentage. And is that something that's going to be addressed when you, you reconsider this in the future? Uh, it's something we've been uh, aware of, uh, of course, since actually the beginning of the scheme. Before I say that, I think, uh, just let me say, I'm sure it's many, many years until uh, Colin reaches uh, the age of needing a bus pass. Um, but what I would say to, to Colin Smith is that uh, we have very strict tests in place when it comes to any bus operator looking to increase the adult fare. Again, uh, for the point of brevity, if the convener would like me to share some of that, uh, we have a standard fares test uh, which applies if any bus operator uh, looks to, to, to increase the adult single fare. That involves having to provide a, a heck of a lot of data to Gordon and the team to analyse, to pour over, uh, to see, for example, if any increase uh, is fair uh, and is justified. So uh, there, there is a standard fares test there. I suppose whatever fare we ended up using, uh, you know, Colin Smith's point would be correct. There, there could be an incentive for some bus operators to, to increase that, but that's why we have the checks and balances very much in place. So if it's helpful to, to the member, uh, I'll go through the usual protocols of going through the convener and we can send some detail on the standard fares test, uh, which we have for the, for the point of uh, brevity. I think that 
helpful, Minister. Uh, th there is one further question from Peter Chapman, uh, and, and then I'd like to ask you if you'd like to make a closing statement. So, Peter. It's just a, uh, yeah, thanks, convener. It's just to explore the cap a wee bit more. Is the 202.1 million an absolute cap? Because you said in previous years you had actually breached the cap. So what happens if you actually, uh, the, the demand is greater than what the cap allows? I'll probably ask my colleague Tom David to come in because, uh, yes, there, there have been uh, times when the, cap pay, the payments have been uh, above the budgetary cap. Um, and again, I'll send the details on, but Tom will be able to come in on probably more detail on that. Thank you, uh, Convener. The, yeah, the cap has been... Uh, claims have exceeded the cap in the past on, I think, uh, one, two, three, four, five occasions. Uh, on three occasions, the cap was applied, so basically claims above the value of the cap towards the end of the year were not met in full. Uh, on two occasions, uh, the claims were met, in effect, met above the cap by means of exceptional payments under the general power, grant giving powers, equivalent to meeting the claims. So they were associated with various issues to do with transitions to new reimbursement arrangements and so on. It's not, if you like, a precedent, but it... The cap is there, it is the cap, but we have on occasion, for good reason, uh, gone beyond it. I think it, uh, from my understanding also, if there's ever been a time when there's been exceptional circumstances uh, that were perhaps out with the bus operator's control, then we're happy to, to look at that. Um, I suppose if we looked at the winter and, and, and the weather we've had, although uh, bad weather tends to depress uh, patronage, uh, if there was the, the opposite effect, uh, that was out with the bus operators control, then we wouldn't be close minded to continuing conversation with them. Um, so, you know, it really is important to stress that the concessionary scheme is really about dialogue uh, with, with the bus operators and we try to be fair where we can. A brief follow up. Yeah, well, I mean, it would appear that the cap isn't a cap. So, I mean, so if, if, if you get to the last three weeks of the, the campaign and, and you've reached the cap, what happens then to, to folk with, with, with bus passes? Does it, do you still, do, are they still on it or what happens? Yeah, they're still on it. I mean, the bus, the bus operator would have to pick up the tab uh, for, for that, uh, would, be, would be my understanding, so they wouldn't get the government reimbursement uh, for that. But as I say, he's uh, absolutely right. I mean, we have to be, I have to have a level of flexibility. The cap is there, and some levels that cap has been applied. But we should also be reasonable, because we know it's based on forecasting, and you don't always get forecasting absolutely right to the penny uh, and to the pound. Um, so it's not an exact science, but uh, we do it based on the data that we have available. So we have some element of flexibility, uh, and really that's uh, based on uh, the, the conversations and good and constructive dialogue uh, that we have with the bus operators. Um, a, a final one, Mr Rumbles. But, 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 but you... it's just, um, I think it's important because if the, whether a capper is there or isn't there, I go back to my first question, which I'd like, like the response from, which is, if one bus company decides to advertise their use and encourage people to use their bus passes and therefore gains more revenue that way, if there is a cap, then the other bus companies will not be reimbursed from the government for that advertising process. Is that correct? No, I, I, I try to see what he's doing there. But look, the, the, the bus operator, of course, uh, would, is no worse or no better off. That's the principle. Uh, of the reimbursement rate. So if it chose to increase patronage uh, by getting more older people to come on and take day trips, uh, then actually as a company, they should be in a, a better position, uh, you would think, uh, even if the cap uh, is breached. Because uh, So I, I, I understand where he's going with the logic, and I think I just go back to my point that the sustainability of it, the long-term sustainability of the scheme, has to be looked at because of the population demographics we have. But if you're asking me as a, as a minister and as a government, have we ever given direction to bus companies about it? My direction would be to be that I think is a very popular scheme. I see the benefits of it. Uh, and if they want to advertise it to get more older people to come on their bus routes, you know, uh, they should absolutely do that. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Do you want to make a short closing statement or do you believe that the questions uh, have, have brought all the points out. No, I'm happy to waive my right to a closing statement. I don't think it's rights. You're not quite in a court yet. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Minister, could I also say that we, we would look forward to receiving the information through the clerks that, that you've undertaken to give us. So <clears throat> on that basis, I'd like to move to agenda item two, 
which is formal consideration of motion 10336 in the name of the Minister of, for Transport and the Islands to recommend that the National Bus Travel Concessionary Scheme for Older and Disabled Persons Scotland Amendment Order 2018 draft be approved. I'd like to invite you, Minister, to move that motion and ask you if you have any further comments to make at this stage. I move the motion uh, in my name. Okay, thank you. I have to formally ask if, if any members have a comment to make. Richard. Yes, it's been uh, quite uh, nice to see that the system, unlike people before saying that it would be done away with or amended, it has been kept, and I can compliment the Minister for that, and I'd be more than happy to uh, approve the order. Um, I think that was a political point. I'm not sure, Minister, if you want to add anything to that. Um, are there any other comments from, from members that, that they'd like to make? No. Okay, so therefore the question is that motion 10336 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I'd now like to briefly suspend the meeting to allow the panel to depart. Thank you, Minister. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to move on to agenda item three, which is subordinate in, uh, legislation. There are two negative instruments and, the, and uh, regarding disabled persons badges for vehicles and the Scottish road, road workers uh, register. There have been no motions to annul received in relation to this instrument. And is the committee agreed it doesn't wish to make any uh, recommendations in relation to these instruments? Good, that is agreed. I'm now going to suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to take uh, their seats. Thank you.
please. Okay, I'd now like to reconvene the meeting and move on to agenda item four, which is to do with salmon farming in Scotland. I'd like to welcome to the committee Donald Cameron, who is here on behalf of the Environment, Cl Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. I am going to ask members to make a declaration of their interests, and before they do, I would like to make a declaration, a more detailed declaration of my interests, so that the committee and everyone is aware of it. Before we start on the next session in agriculture, and in particular salmon farming, I want to make this detailed declaration of interest. As members will know, my register of interest shows that I'm a co-owner of a wild salmon fishery. This salmon fishery is on the River Spey and the east coast of Scotland. The migration routes for smolts leaving the river and salmon returning to the river are along the east coast, which has no significant salmon farming that can affect these fish. Thus, salmon farming has no impact on my registered interest as a salmon fishing proprietor. I want to make it clear that I approach this inquiry with a very open mind, with over 40 years' experience in salmon biology. I understand that salmon farming has a significant role to play in a vibrant Scottish economy, and that is the way I will be approaching uh, this inquiry. I wondered if there were any other members of the committee who would like to make a declaration of interest relating to salmon fishing in particular. Donald. Um, thank you, convener. Obviously not a member of the committee, but I feel it would be appropriate to refer to my register of interests uh, and two interests therein. Firstly, um, fish farming, uh, and that I own a property that um, benefits from an income from fish farming. And secondly, to uh, fishing as in, in terms of a wild fishery. I'd like to put that on record. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> this is our first evidence session on the Committee's Salmon Farming in Scotland inquiry. And the Committee will take evidence today from the Aquaculture Research Body and an economist with a detailed knowledge of the sector. I'd like to welcome the following witnesses. Professor Paul Tett, Reader in Coastal Ecosystems, the Scottish Association for Marine Science. Professor James, that, should I say Bron? Bron, thank you. Professor in Aquaculture at the University of Stirling. Professor Harv Mirgod, I hope I've got that right. Professor of Aquacultural Breeding and Physiology, the University of Stirling and Steve Westbrook, an economist and author of the 2017 HIE and Marine Scotland report on the value of aquaculture to Scotland. So, welcome. Um, if I could say to you, I think you've all given evidence before at committee, so you know you don't need to push any of the buttons in front of you. That all happens automatically. If you'd like to say anything or come back or answer a specific question, if you catch my eye, I will try and bring you in at the appropriate moment. Um, as I do say to committee members as well, please, once you're speaking, don't then studiously avoid my eye, because I may want to condense your answer to allow somebody else in, uh, so that everyone gets a, a, a chance. So, the, I'd like to move, if I may, straight to the first question, which I believe, John Mason, you're going to ask. Uh, thanks, convener. Well, at the start of this uh, inquiry, um, clearly, one of the uh, huge areas around salmon farming is exports. So my questions are around exports. And so I really want to ask just a general question. Is it the case that however much we produce, we will be able to export it? Uh, or are, could it ever be the case that we were producing more that we couldn't export? Or should we be even, we could touch on, <coughs> could we be selling more at the home end? But, I mean, it does, clearly, in recent days, we've had the United States talking about uh, tariffs on some goods, I don't think on uh, fish at the moment, but uh, should we be concerned about exports, or can we just export as much as we can produce? Steve, I think that would be you. <laughs> on that one, we're certainly currently, um, there's no constraint in the sense that however much the uh, salmon farms in Scotland produce, they can be sold either in the home market or the export market. As you'll probably be aware, um, the, the, the industry is structured such that the same companies that dominate the Scottish industry have also got uh, businesses in Norway, Chile, uh, and other countries. So they kind of tactically divide up the world market be between them. Uh, and Scotland, uh, from our figures, um, produce about 7.5% of world production. So it's a relatively minor player worldwide. 
uh, the, the um, feedback we got when we were carrying out uh, research for this study, um, we spoke to all of the main producing companies and other people with the knowledge of the sector, that the industry had, while we were actually producing the work, um, had come out with expectations of doubling production by, by 2030, and our brief all, all also had been to look to the period to, towards 2030. Uh, and nobody's got any doubts that if they did double, th that they might not be able to sell it. The, um, the, the growth of the uh, world market and <coughs> these people also um, being involved with other countries know the kind of plans and scenarios, if you like. So, uh, so the simple answer to that question is that there doesn't seem to be a, a constraint, but things change, obviously, you know, when one's looking 10 years ahead. Get it the other way around, would there be enough uh, food? Because I understand the food is imported largely. Would there be enough food to feed all these salmon? Uh, again, um, that's something which uh, can be expanded. I mean, Marine Harvest, you might be aware, are opening their own food plants in, in Sky, And that's going to... In fact, there's a bit, bit, a bit of concern uh, in, 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 by some people that that would actually reduce the uh, sales and, and the production of the other companies in the UK. So, again, that there's no evidence uh, that I've seen that, uh, where there's a, a, a constraint. Uh, I was wondering if, if somebody wanted to come in. I was wondering, James, if you wanted to come in uh, on, the, on the food issue that, that John's raised or whether somebody else on the panel would like to uh, look at that or comment on that. Yeah, yeah I'd be happy to, to comment on that. Um, so fish meal and fish oil is actually what we're discussing about. It's a, it's a finite uh, resource. Um, but there's been a lot of innovation to try to find alternative diets. And, uh, and the research has been uh, ongoing now for at least 10 years, where there is a number of ways where we can substitute the diet. So I don't feel that at the moment uh, the diets will be the main limitation to the industry to grow. Uh, this said, it is a global market. Um, as it was just said, uh, and it really depends on how the growth uh, is sustained in other parts of the world. I'm thinking about Chile, for example, or Canada, or Tasmania, and there is uh, aspiration for growth all over the world. So we have to look into uh, really the global supply. Uh, but I think a lot of these new innovations, which are bringing different types of proteins uh, or meals, um, have already been included in the diet. And I think um, I don't see any reason why this is not going to go further. Um, so I don't believe it's really a major issue. I think we're going to come a bit more <clears throat> onto that later. So but can I come back to you, John, for some more questions? Sir, uh, thanks very much. I think probably just one more question. But um, you, you've kind of stressed, Mr. Uh, Westbrook, about the, how it's a global market and all of this kind of thing. Now, it's also been suggested, I think, by HIE that uh, perhaps um, Scotland would do better if our salmon was seen as more distinct um, on the one hand, but on the other hand, we, I think we do have protected geographical indication for Scottish salmon, so I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm kind of fairly new to this. Uh, is, Scot is Scottish salmon seen as distinct around the world, and is it more important that it should be more distinct? The, the branding in the UK is very much that Scottish salmon is the, the prime product, and, and supermarkets and others will, will stress that, and they'll put the name of the farm on the packaging and so on. Uh, it, it, it's a bit more dubious about whether Scottish salmon is actually better than salmon, say, for, for Norway. It can be a ma matter of taste, and no doubt at all in the countries where uh, Norwegian salmon is being promoted, they'll be promoting Norwegian salmon as the best. Um, so, but that is, that is quite important to the UK market. Now, with, with exports, there, there can be differentiation. So there's the Label Rouge in France, which marine harvest uh, supply, so a percentage of their products, in fact, their, their best products, if you like, goes under that label. So there's a kind of branding even within the, the production. Uh, and <coughs> speaking to um, West of Ross Salmon, who are one of the smaller producers uh, as part of this study, about how they sell into the uh, American market, that, that, that's very much niche. So they, will, they or their agents will uh, speak to restaurant chains and such like and promote their salmon as being the best. And in fact, they sell in, in America they sell it as Western Ross salmon rather than Scottish salmon. So there's, there's a lot, lot of ways in which the branding um, works, but um, the reality is tricky because um, even when they're selling in supermarkets and they're depending on using Scottish salmon, if there's a shortage of supply and they have to bring in Norwegian salmon instead, they have to market it in such a way that um, it's a bit more generic. Okay, 
Thank you. Peter, I think you've got a supplementary there. I'm interested, uh, Mr Westbrook. You said that the uh, Scottish uh, pro produce was about 7.5% of the world, world marketplace. I assume that was for farm salmon you were speaking. Salmon. What percentage of the, the, uh, of the demand for salmon is actually uh, supplied through wild salmon catches? I mean, it, uh, and just to get a feel for how much is farmed and how much is actually wild salmon. I mean, we... ha haven't looked at that recently, but um, some years ago when we looked at it, it was very dominant, the, the, the percentage share of wild salmon compared with farm salmon. E even, even top restaurants now, you tend to see farm fish and there'll be um, farm fish from Shetland, they'll be putting forward as a, as a prime product. And mm. certainly in my experience, you very rarely see wild salmon on the menu. Okay. Yes, I uh, can give, give you some figures for that. So the, the most recent figures I have for commercial landings of wild salmon um, in the northwestern Atlantic region, so that's the whole of northern Europe, are about 2,000 tonnes a year. So you can compare that with the Scottish harvest for farm salmon, uh, 160, 170,000 tonnes, and the Norwegian harvest of over a million tonnes. It's a very, very small percentage of the marketplace. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Stuart. Just on that, in looking at the world market, uh, Alaskan salmon, which is a reasonably significant player, is wild salmon, is it not? It, it, uh, well, it's a salmonoid, it's a different uh, species. Um, you might be yes. better, yeah, I think that, that is true. So there's a very large wild stocks there. So in fact, they, there's very little um, farming um, in, in most of that area. Is there a brief way of characterising the difference between Alaskan salmon and uh, the salmon that is bred in the, and, uh, in, in the farms? No, the, because they're a different, an entirely different species and they're very easily to differentiate. You can do it by appearance. Um, if you had to, if you had just had a fillet, you could do it by a range of tests, including molecular tests of various sorts. <laughs> So they're very easy to distinguish. I mean, in the supermarkets, the wild salmon that you're talking about is less fatty, uh, definitely, than the, the Scottish salmon. But f for me, as a, as a consumer of it, the, the element of fat makes it actually perfect for frying and, and, and baking and such like, as opposed to the uh, wild fish being dry. But it's a matter of taste. OK. Uh, we're going to move on to the next question, which is Fulton. Morning, panel. <coughs> um, we talked a wee bit there about the, um, the Norwegian uh, salmon as well. And uh, the briefing notes here say that three of the uh, five largest um, salmon farm companies are Norwegian-owned. Does this have any impact at all on the benefits to Scotland? It's, um, it's a tricky one because, uh, I mean, t t 20, 25 years ago, there was a lot of small producers uh, in, in Scotland did a study on Sky. Um, 25 years ago, and there were lots and lots of small producers, and gradually they got taken over by the by these multinationals. So they now uh, dom dominate the industry. I think one um, one downside we were asked to look at some um, intellectual capital and innovation and such like taking place in the sector a as a driver of economic impact. And there's no doubt that the bigger companies tend to focus that, like Green Harvest, in in Norway. Um, so we don't quite have those jobs. But what it does mean is that when um, new technologies come about, and I think one of the key ones is going to be uh, being able to develop larger sites offshore, also recirculation small units onshore. Most of the R&D work is being done in Norway for that. So, but w once the technologies are proven, they can then be imported here and brought in cost-effectively. So, so it's, it's a, <coughs> actually quite probably quite a beneficial balance. Does anyone else want to add to that? Uh, Fulton, do you want to follow that up, or are you, are you happy with that? Well, really just to say, I mean, I'm, I'm not personally, uh, you know, no bothered where somebody, you know, comes from if they're, they're running uh, an organisation or, or a company, but it does seem that the Norwegian uh, thing's significant and that from earlier answers there, um, obviously a competitor, but it, I suppose what I was trying to get out there is, there, is there any impact on the Scottish market because they're Nor Norwegian-owned companies? Beneficial in the sense that some... Um, because if you take Marine Harvest, for, for example, the, the, the largest producer, they split the market so that they're selling most of their UK production in the UK. It, it, it fits, if you like, their national model. Now, let, let's suppose that they didn't have any UK site or Scottish sites. 
they were selling the Norwegian salmon into Scotland and competing against the others. So it's actually, I think, beneficial. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, thanks. I, th I think we'll move on to the next question, which is Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning, panel. Uh, my question actually leads nicely on from the line of questioning that Phil McGregor um, had just uh, started, and it's to do with the HIE report, Steve, that um, you had quite a big input into. And um, it estimates that the direct, indirect and induced impacts of salmon farming creates 10,340 jobs or thereabouts in Scotland. Could you tell us about these um, direct, indirect jobs and where they're located, roughly? Yeah. Um, Part of our brief wasn't to specify rural Scotland or the Highlands Islands within the Scottish total. I'd quite like to have done that. But actually, just working through, um, because of this uh, session, the different categories, um, th this is a report that any figures that I'm quoting will, uh, is taken from. So HI, this is on HIE's website, and uh, it was released uh, last July. But there's a table in there which shows all the different supply chain elements which add up to this 10,300 that you mentioned. Now, very approximately, uh, almost half of those will be in rural Scotland, of which nearly all will be in the Highlands and Islands, uh, if you include Inverness as, as rural. Um, uh, that about about 5,000 of those, roughly. Now, the vast majority of, uh, of jobs on the sites are in the Highlands and Islands. Um, most of the processing jobs now are in other parts of Scotland. They've moved, they've tended to move a, a, a bit away. But, I mean, one, one aspect of the types of jobs, which is important, um, I mean, in the Scottish economy, there's an increasing problem of um, low earnings uh, occupations and sectors going up and higher paying ones going down. And the, the rates of pay for people actually working on the farms is relatively good compared with, say, people working in processing. Um, so not only is it an, an important <coughs> employer out of that total, but the types of jobs are very suitable or have been suitable for the people in the rural areas who perhaps haven't had other, other opportunities, with, particularly with farming jobs going down, fishing jobs going down in many areas. Okay, um, thanks. You also talk about the additional economic benefits, and I represent a, a big rural constituency myself, and I know that... We, a lot of these places have jobs that have had partners that have had other jobs. We've kept local schools open, all these kinds of things. Um, what social and community impacts from fish farms do these rural communities um, get from them? And also, um, the community charter covering the SSPOs, and they talk about the Community Benefit Fund. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more about that as well? Right, I'm not too familiar with the Community Benefit Fund as such. Um, if we look at the impacts of the individual companies that have got some um, sites, farming sites, and um, we've done work for Marine Harvest, Scottish Salmon Company, West Ross Salmon and, and others on that question about employment. And it, it, it actually has been a very beneficial mixture because if, if you come into a local area, you might create even perhaps 10 or 12 jobs, um, then something like half of those jobs go to local people who benefit from them, but also people move in. To, to, to fill the other jobs, and that helps to repopulate uh, or even increase the population of some areas. Partners come in and get other jobs, so work we've done, again, for the, for the other companies shows that um, quite a lot of the partners will be working in local hospitals, local teaching in local schools and such like, so there's a very strong element there. Other, another important impact is where, um, say, a marine site is developed, and that is then usable by other uh, sectors and leisure boats can use it and such like and the the industries are very well integrated into their communities uh, certainly that's the again the message that we that we get um that they're not just valued for the jobs that they're providing but also the um other wider wider impacts okay thank you okay we're going to move on to the next question steve i think you've you, you you've been put under the spotlight so maybe there's a chance for uh, some of the other witnesses to come in and, and I think this may be the question that allows them to do that. So, Jamie. Uh, thank you, Gavina. Good morning, panel. Um, uh, could I start with um, asking some questions around statistics? Uh, I'm hoping someone in the panel has the knowledge. I've gone through my briefing papers, but I can't, can't find them specifically. Uh, what proportion of uh, salmon which is farmed in Scotland uh, is consumed in the domestic market and what percentage is exported? 
I, 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 I do want to see if I can bring another member of the panel in as well. So if there's anyone else that would like to come in, if you could just indicate. If not, I'm going to let Steve. Steve, looks like you're still under the spotlight. Sports are tricky because the figures that you see are a combination of, um, of, of, of fish um, that, that is just sold as, as, as produced and processed fish. And you, it, you can get double counting sometimes. Also, there's re-exporting. There's fish that come, say, from the Faroes down to Grimsby and then gets re-exported and comes into the export figures, even though it's not produced in this country. So it's actually quite complex. But I, I would say, as a rule of thumb, that about half of, of the um, Scottish production is consumed in, in the UK, in one way or another, either up with, with or without uh, processing and packaging and such like. Thank you. And, and apologies, Steve. I think, unfortunately, these line of questions may remain your side of the table, but we have many others for the, the rest of the panel. Um, all, all of the fish which is consumed uh, in Scotland or indeed the UK, is that fish processed in the UK or does it exit the UK and come back as a processed product? I think uh, I don't. I haven't come across any examples where it's um, where it's processed and then comes back. There might be the, the very occasional one because of world markets. It might occasionally happen, but no. Okay. Generally speaking, all the value add is added in in the, in in the UK. Not always in Scotland, but in the UK. Okay. So therefore, on the export market, um, I, I presume a, a, a proportion of that export market is uh, is whole fish as opposed to processed fish. So I guess what, where I'm heading with this line of question is, uh, is there more opportunity for Scotland to develop its processing uh, industry? Uh, I, I read from our notes that the uh, number of processors has decreased uh, quite dramatically over the last 10 years as we were exporting more whole fish. Um, is that, uh, what are the reasons why the uh, whole fish export market is, is increasing and why do you think the processing industry is, is uh, not doing yeah. so well in that respect? I mean, the economics tend to work better if the fish is processed closer to where the consumers consume it, not, not least because in some countries the um, rates of pay and such like in processing, whether it's smoking or whatever, are much lower than in the UK. So there's always going to be that, that trend. But there has been uh, an upward trend as well in the UK uh, for processing and you know, if you look in your supermarkets, there's, almost every year there's more and more products, more and more different salmon products uh, around. And, and the, more, the, 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 the more value is added to them, the more packs are made smaller, the more employment impact there is in the UK from that. So I, I don't think there's a, an issue of, um, of lost opportunity, if you like, of, of, of more processing in this country. I think it's, it's tending to happen. So you seem quite buoyant about the processing industry in that respect. Yeah, the problem, well, we may come on to Brexit, but there's a problem potentially with labour supply in with, processing. With what, sorry? There's a potential problem with labour supply in processing because of very high dependence on, uh, on overseas uh, labour. We'll keep your comments to, Brexit, to, to the section on Brexit, which you rightly say is, is coming down uh, the tracks to us and later in this session. Jamie, is there anything further you'd like to... Stuart, um, hopefully now um, we're going to get some of the other panel witnesses in. So, Stuart... Um, well, I wouldn't hold your breath too much, um, because I think it's probably after me that we <laughs> moved to uh, scientific matters. However, there, there can be a scientific aspect to this. I'm interested in uh, how we get the maximum yield off a fish carcass. Now, of course, in part, that can be how we breed it, how we operate the farm, uh, but also it can be the industrial process that's related to that. Uh, so what, what are we doing to improve the proportion of a, a, a whole fish that uh, goes, who's getting the flesh for consumption? Now, before seeking an answer uh, to that, I, I would say I recently visited uh, someone in my parliamentary constituency whose business is to retrieve the discards from the processing the heads and, men, and the, the, um, the skeletal uh, remains, uh, and they turn that into food, much of which he exports dried to West Africa, where it's regarded as a delicacy. Uh, so there's clearly scope for doing more than we, we're currently doing. But what is the industry doing um, that, that, that helps drive up yield from the carcasses? Who'd like to ah. do our scope, I'm afraid. <laughs> OK. I think from the economic side, it's quite high. I mean, the, the um, impression I get from the companies is that they do 
uh, try and use as high a proportion uh, as they can. And if you buy dog food, for example, there'll be salmon in that, and that will be the very lowest quality, if you like, that they can get off of the salmon. So I've not actually heard anybody saying <coughs> that there's an opportunity to, to, to increase that, but I don't know whether colleagues no, have got I, any. I would, I would agree. Um, I'm not aware that there is uh, a lot of opportunity to increase the yield. I think a lot of work has been done uh, toward this. I think uh, a lot of new technologies also have been implemented in processing uh, farms. And it is such an important part of the business, of salmon farming, to make sure that you recover as much of the product as you can. And now a lot of the trimmings also are starting to be converted into added value products. Um, over the years, there's been selective breeding that's been used, uh, which obviously one of the traits, they have many of them, one of the traits was um, quality, but also yield. Um, which is really the mass, the muscle that you're producing. Um, I think they're still selecting for it, um, but I don't know if there's actually a lot of scope now to increase um, significantly. Uh, well, in, in relation to the biology of the fish, um, does the yield go up as the age of the fish goes up? In other words, is there an incentive to keep the fish longer because you'll get more out of it for lower investment? No. Or is there an incentive that moves in the other direction? It's the opposite. Because of the constraints on our biomass and what sites can produce, there's something like a 24-month cycle for, for, for the salmon. And the quicker they can harvest it and get them, you know, after a fallow period, get the next fish in, that's, that's very much in their interest, rather than keeping the fish as long as possible in the, in the, on the farms. And is it a better product if it grows more slowly? I think it might depend if it's growing more slowly. It might be because it's not being as well fed or whatever, um, or you know, the conditions in the areas that, that are slow growing might not be as good. I mean, Shetland, for example, they may have the best uh, conditions in, in Scotland with the kind of currents and areas that, that, are, that are, um, uh, are growing salmon. I think the, the salmon is, is quite fast growing up in Shetland. Mm -hmm. no, I think that the feeds they're given, and they, as you say, the environment they're brought up in will have different effects on flesh quality. So it's less about age. Than their, than their experience, as it were. Maybe, maybe just as a final, to close off my little section here, um, is there scope here, a requirement for further research? Because I'm hearing there are diverse outcomes in different parts of our geography um, that might have diverse economic benefits and disbenefits. Is there enough research? Now, of course, this is an invitation to the three academics to... Uh, uh, respond in a particular way, but it would want to be the committee would want to hear evidence rather than simply opinion. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Go on. Just on the, on the economic front, one of the interesting questions for the next 10 15 years is the, um, the progress that might be made in, on sites further offshore. When we did a report back in, I think it was 2007, uh, on, on the Scottish sector, everybody was saying then, and this is the industry, that we would have that by now. And it's really quite interesting the way the, the um, production has, has grown since then because they've been so profitable. They haven't, in a way, had to take the risk and make the extra investments of that. But, um, you know, as our report shows, that if the industry is going to achieve its target of doubling, that is going to <coughs> involve more sites offshore, bigger sites. And it's very possible, again, my colleagues might have a better idea about this, that if the fish is being grown further offshore in different types of conditions, it may be high quality. But I, was, um, I think the size matter, of course it matters, because the yield would increase with size uh, to some extent, but to a point where then the fish will potentially start to mature. And maturation during the ongoing is very detrimental because you're using a lot of yield. So um, I guess it's, it's not only true in salmon, it's true in most species. Um, you want to grow the fish to optimal size, which is for the market and for the yield, but before some of the physiology and biology takes over, like maturation, which then is working against the industry and has quality um, uh, concerns, but also has uh, concerns for the welfare of the fish uh, when they mature. So I, th I think the industry has always been trying to be producing fish that are relatively large, and that's the reason why salmon is a large fish, five, six kilo, uh, potentially more if possible, but there is a risk then that other physiological events will uh, be detrimental. Um, the, there's two follow-ups. I'd just like to ask a question. One of the things that became clear in the uh, 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 
a clear report was the fact that there were use of RAS and lump suckers for uh, lice removal. Um, obviously, the, there is a limited lifespan of these fish uh, with, within the regulations. I mean, is that a market? Is there a market for RAS uh, once, uh, you know, for edible and, and lump suckers? I, I don't know what the answer to that is. And is that something that fish farms should be looking at or are looking at? I don't know who has a... Uh, I can I can probably I, mean, I can try to answer uh, the questions. Um, so that this is a very very important um, consideration that the industry is looking into, um, especially because the number of cleaner fish is large, has been increasing, and there's always been a concern on what can we do with these fish at the end of the cycle uh, once they've done their job. Um, the two species are extremely different in terms of their biology and in terms of the potential for de developing uh, products and added value. At the moment, the RAS, especially the Balan RAS, um, there's been uh, a development into exports in Asia, where there is a market uh, for the fish. Um, there's not so much a market in Europe. It's not seen as a, a very good fish to eat. Um, you could argue maybe if in France a little bit, you can find it in some uh, French recipe, but this is, this is not really uh, what consumers are looking for. Um, there are other potential interesting biotechnological development that could come also from, uh, from RAS species. Um, without going too much in details, uh, there are uh, specificities and pigments that are in uh, the blood, um, which have some very interesting uh, pharmaceutical um, uh, property. Um, and it's already been used uh, as a very powerful an antioxidant. So what I'm trying to illustrate is that the industry and the scientific community is very proactive at trying to find markets for this fish. If you look at lump sucker, it's a bit different. There is a, a well-known, I'm sure you're aware, um, a fisheries and market uh, based on the caviar, um, for the roe uh, from the fish. Uh, but in terms of the value, nutritional value of the fish itself for consumers, also it's, it's not really yet um, identified how we could uh, market them. A number of chefs, around the world have already been trying to be very innovative in the way they could cook and prepare and transform these products. And um, I think some successes are coming, but uh, we're still not there. So it's one of these uh, times where I'm going to say more research is definitely needed in order to better use the kind of fish. Hey, Peter, do you want a, a brief follow-up and then we'll move, move yeah, on? Yeah, I mean, Stuart, I, we're, we're looking to get maximum yield. I mean, is there any market out there to use the carcass and the bit that's left and, and process that into fish meal and then feed it back to the salmon. Is that happening? Because that used to happen with meat and bone meal and it was, it was banned because of for very, very good reasons. I just want to, I want to be sure, you know, is, is that a part of the process at all? Um, you noticed there was a sort of nervousness amongst the committee there because of the previous probably effects of, of doing that in, in sheep and, and cattle. Who'd like to uh, head off down the route on that? Uh, no one. Uh. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm gonna give a, a formal answer, but what I could say is that it is definitely not done. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean that fish trimmings are not used, but from other species. So in other words, I mean, you're not, we cannot feed salmon from trimmings of salmon. Um, that's definitely not something that uh, is allowed. Uh, but trimmings and heads and other products coming from other fisheries and other species can actually be included in the, in the form of uh, fish oil and fish meal. And these are very high value because we are always looking at the fish meal and fish oil and uh, being a problem. But obviously there, they have very rich um, content in fish meal and fish oil. So reason why they are used. The, the oils or the... Um, um, the product that are um, obtained from the trimmings from salmon can be used, but that cannot be used in the salmon industry. It can be used in others industry, and that can involve livestock industry, for example, or very different species. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. I think the next question, uh, Richard, is you. Good morning, gentlemen. The situation with salmon has the industry has grown uh, excellently over the last number of years, and we want it to grow more. But the one problem we have, and I feel as we're coming into the questions that I think are touching on the problem that the industry has, is fish health and mortality ch challenges. They've got losses, uh, quite a, a substantial amount of losses through uh, escapes, 
and also through mortality. Uh, and I'm reminded of um, people now like uh, free-range hens, don't like battery-type uh, uh, situations. So we've got um, pens that, t to my mind, and, and I don't, I'm, I don't, uh, I'm not near a fish farm, but to my mind, are substantially uh, too many fish in the pen. Uh, does that cause disease? Uh, why has farm salmon mortality increased in recent years? Why is there a difference between mortality rates in Scotland and in Norway? And we've just heard that some of the, the, the companies uh, that own the ones in Scotland are Norwegian. So why is there differences? Um, I've got a few questions, Convener, but I'll try and uh, put one or two together. Well, uh, Richard, I'm, I'm very happy because they're, they're, they're quite complex questions right. that you're asking. Would, would you mind if we gave the panel a chance to answer that f one first and then move on to Just the to others? Just to make sure I get time to ask these you questions. Will get, you will get time, Thank you very Mr Lyle. Who would like to head off on that? Uh, I mean, it seems to be fundamental. Of the mortality rate, which um, is... Harv, do you want to do that and then I'll try and bring James in? I'll make... Do you want to start on that? Yeah, if you want. So I, I can get started because I wanted to make two points. And I, and I think while uh, mortality is, no mortality is acceptable. So that, that's very clear. Um, but the thing is, to, uh, we, to put things in perspective, I think we also need to look into mortalities uh, in, in salmon, wild salmon, and mortalities in other species that are economically important all over the world. Um, I mean, again, it's, I'm not justifying mortalities, and I think we're going to come onto the subject and explain uh, a little bit further differences with Norway and the challenges that the industry is meeting. But the first point is the mortality um, in uh, wild salmon. When you're looking at, uh, usually it's above 90%. Uh, there's a number of studies that have been done in the UK, um, um, in the States, uh, also in Norway, um, that are showing that in some really very few cases, you have 70% mortality, which is very, very few, which was actually one example. Most of the time, it's between 90, uh, up to 99% uh, mortality. So in terms of the biology of the species, this is what's happening in the wild. Uh, again, it doesn't justify the fact that mortalities can be high in farming. But the other point I wanted to make is that salmon and other species like salmonids are unique in terms of the level of mortality, which is very low compared to any other species that is farmed uh, in the sea all over the world. I think, again, it's not justifying, but it's important to understand, I think. Um, if, you, if you take uh, most important marine fin fish species in Europe and in the world, the lowest level um, of mortality that you find will be in sea bass and sea bream. Um, usually you can have up to 40% survival, which is very high for marine fish. Um, but when you look into other temperate species, like cod, um, you will, at best, get lower than 10%. And survival, 10% survival, 90% mortalities. And if you look into, uh, there's a lot of experience on cod, because cod farming and cod research has been very active over the last 20 years in the UK before the, the, the industry or the cod industry collapse. If you look into the wild, there are studies also that have been looking at cod mortalities, and you're looking at 99.95, a fraction of a percent survival in the wild in the species. So what I'm saying is that these species overall all have biology, all have been adapting in a way that the number of offspring they produce versus the survival is an adaptation for survival in the wild environment. So that, that was just these two points I wanted to make. And now, again, I think we need to go a little bit deeper. I'm sure James will be very happy to start to explain the health challenges. Um, that we find. So, so I'll continue if I can. So we're in a particular period um, when we have a diverse range of health challenges. So in the past, um, it's been a much more simple situation. But particularly at the moment, we have an axis, really, between sea lice and these complex gill um, pathologies. And these gill pathologies are caused by a range of different pathogens and environmental influences. So we have um, viral pathogens, uh, bacterial pathogens, parasites, and also the effects of water temperature causing algal blooms, which again um, cause gill problems. And these also feed back to sea lice as well. So we've got a number of different pathogens. And so these mortalities, um, in part, 
result from the combination of these different pathogens. So we don't, if, you, if you've been looking at these lists of the causes of mortality, so, so there was a list put out recently, so the main um, recorded mortalities um, come down to um, the gills, some viral pathogens, um, and also um, in terms of non-infectious reasons, we have algal uh, damage, so damage from algal blooms, um, damage from treatments, um, losses due to poor performing fish, and also losses due to handling. We're in a, in a particular position at the moment where we have had very good control, for instance, of sea lice in the recent past, but that is now, and that has been largely due to the use of um, veterinary medicines, but now we're getting less um, efficacious effect, uh, medicines due to drug resistance, um, we have a period where we're having to move from a situation where we're mostly or, or have a large input from, from drug use to one where we're having to use a lot of different um, other treatments. So we're, much ha we're having to rely much more on, uh, on the use of different approaches, mechanical approaches or physical approaches, um, use of drugs, use of management tools, a whole range of different uh, approaches used to control the salmon. Um, you asked also about differences with Norway. We have a, quite a different um, industry and we also have a different uh, range of environments here. So then parts of Norway, they have very low problems uh, for some of these pathogens, whereas we have um, quite extensive problems with the pathogens through Scotland. Um, I'm not sure if I've... Was yeah. If the, to go on, there's a couple of people who want to come in on this particular question. I, if, if there's I another get, question... Yes, this, absolutely. Just go quick, for it. So basically, gentlemen, what you're telling me, or correct me if I'm wrong, that we'll have high mortality rates and we can't do anything about it? Not at all, no. So I think that's... OK, so... Um, so there, there's an impression given in the report there that nothing has really happened in, st in terms of control of pathogens. Okay, fair enough. Um, so I, I've been working with sea lice for a long time now, and if you looked at the farms when I started there, there were farms that maybe had 100 sea, louse, sea lice, or an average of 100 sea lice per fish. So our control compared to the, the earlier industry is much better now. Even if we look at, um, say, the the period between 2013 and now, um, there hasn't, there's an impression that, that we're suddenly getting a lot more um, sea lice, for instance, these sort of things. But if you look at the actual figures, and there's a recent paper by um, Hall and Murray, we can see that actually the numbers of sea lice have not been increasing. And the reason they're not, not increasing is because we have um, a lot more tools at our disposal to help to, uh, to, help to control these these pathogens. But there's a particular problem at the moment with these gills, with the axis of sea lice and these gill problems. And what that means is that it's much more difficult to treat the sea lice or the gill problems because the gill problems um, give the fish physiological problems. Obviously, they make it more difficult for the fish to um, respire effectively. And if their respiration is challenged, then any handling stress or treatment stress may tend to impact their welfare or health. So in order, and, and we've had, a, as I say, that there's been a transition where we've had to learn how to deal with these problems. But I think the industry is now much better equipped to do that. So we've had a lot of new technologies, new equipment in, both to remove sea lice and to treat these, these gill problems. And I think the industry has, has learned how to cope with those now. But I think that in the recent past, there's been a transition where people had to learn how to treat them. So we use um, a range of, we have a range of drugs available for treating sea lice, and some of those, hydrogen peroxide, for instance, has, um, is used to treat both sea lice and amoebic gill disease. We can use fresh water again to treat amoebic gill disease and some other, other things. And we can also... Um, by, by moving diagnostics earlier for these gill problems, that is to say, able to detect the problem earlier, we're able to treat it much more effectively and the problem and the mortality problems and the health problems are therefore much um, less serious if we can start to treat them earlier. Richard, I'm going to bring uh, other members in and then come back to you if I may. Gail, I think you've got a question and then Fulton. 
Yeah, thanks, convener. I don't even know if there's um, statistics on this, but we're talking about farm fish. Do we have any figures of the per percentage of mortality in wild fish that's down to infection and disease? very very poor on that it's really the ocean is really a, a black box and and the problem is um so that it's very difficult to access that you can look at the number of fish that go out and the number of fish that come back again and that gives you an, a, an indication of mortality at sea but in terms of the causes you can identify that's very hard to do you can also uh, monitor wild fish for the presence of pathogens but, but normally that won't necessarily tell you about mortalities. Often we can, we can have um, pathogens that sit there and don't do any damage and therefore don't have an impact on mortality. So some of the viral pathogens are present in wild fish but don't, but don't seem to have any effect there. So that it's very difficult. And the other problem is unless you get a huge die-off of fish so that they're washing up on beaches, people ne will never know if fish are dying or not. And, and also, they won't be looking at the causes of them, of, of any deaths on the whole. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Fulton. Yeah, um, just something you mentioned in your response to Richard Lyle. Um, a minute ago there, that, that quite concerned me. Now, I know that we're talking, we're going to be talking about med uh, medicines and such like later on, so I'm conscious I don't want to uh, steal anyone's thunder as such, but... Um, I was quite concerned when you were talking about resistance developing and that I'm assuming that part of that will be a antibiotic resistance. Now, that's a, that's a big problem worldwide. Um, how widespread is antibiotic use in uh, the farmed salmon and what are, is the industry doing to tackle resistance both in the salmon, but I'm assuming if fish are taking antibiotics, then you know we're getting them in the food chain as well. To, to be honest, there's very little use of antibiotics, in, um, particularly in the marine environment. But I think overall now, because we have very effective vaccines against the diseases that used to require antibiotic treatment, the use of antibiotics is tiny. And in fact, in Scotland, I think we, we use less than the other countries, than the other salmon farming countries on the whole. So Chile, Chile still uses a lot of antibiotics. And in fact, I think they, they've not been able to sell fish to certain markets because of the level of antibiotics in them. Scotland uses almost none because of the use of very effective vaccines. So I think that, that hasn't been a problem in Scotland. Paul, cool. in you, you wanted to come in there, Paul. It was just, it was just briefly to confirm confirm that, although uh, we did discuss in the Environment Committee the problems in getting specific data on antibiotic use in Scotland. Uh, um, the, ev the evidence that is available suggests confirms what my colleague had said that it, antibiotic use in Scottish salmon farming is very low, much much lower uh, than in either Chile or parts of North America. Thank you, um, Richard. Back to you. I have a, a, a number of other questions, but you didn't answer or, or answer one one uh, point I put. Would um, creating more pens and having less density of fish in those pens be better off for fish uh, mortality? Yes or no? I don't, so so the, the, the densities that are used uh, in, in, the, in the earlier days, they had very high densities of farming, but work that we did at the Institute and elsewhere um, established um, the cut-off points for, um, for where health and welfare might suffer, and therefore the farms all use relatively low um, fish density. So in terms of the, um, the effects on the health of the fish, I think the densities are, are about right. And, the, and I, I can't speak for salmon, but for, for other species of fish, um, often they need certain densities to be happy and healthy. So for some fish species, they need a certain density um, to relieve them of stress. I don't know of the no. levels for salmon. Do you know that? I think for, for salmon, the, the levels are 15 uh, kilogram per cubic meter. But something that is important to consider is because of the natural behavior of salmon of schooling, um, they will tend to congregate, to come together and swim together. So in other words, if you actually have more pens with less fish, they will still be swimming together in some area of the pens. Um, so this has been a challenge um, to try actually to have a better usage of the volume that is available. But 
this is their natural behavior. And that's the reason why density matters for their well-being, but also for the performance. Because they are not, a, they are not fish that like to swim in isolation. They're cool together. I always wanted to ask, and thanks for answering that. Um, the Eclair Committee, of which I'm also a member of, uh, report stated the overall number of deaths as a result of disease, ill health and stress may be masked by the early harvesting of fish with disease or life-threatening conditions. Would you agree this is the case or not? The, the causes of death there? Yeah. Um, I don't think stress, um, I mean, stress can cause other conditions. Um, so then if there are, say, environmental stresses, things like high temperature in particular have a, have a big effect on pathogens and algal blooms, etc., and these will be stressful. The more you need to handle fish or treat them, um, the more they'll be subjected <coughs> to stress, and th these can have impacts. But I don't... I'm not sure what you mean by diet, dying of stress, really. I think that stress is very important on a farm, and the farmers do everything they can to keep that low. But I think that... The, the sea temperature has risen by up to 15%. Uh, sorry, 15 degrees. In, uh, 15 degrees in the last number of years. Has that had any effect? I think it, it won't be that high, the, the rise in sea temperature, but I think there are, there are rising sea temperatures and those, those will have an impact. Do you have a...? Yeah, so, so the average sea temperature has gone up by about a degree uh, in the last generation. Um, it roughly reflects air temperature uh, ar ar around Scotland. It, it's still... Sea temperatures for most of the year are still within the optimum range for salmon growth. That was, a, that was actually a quote from, some, from a salmon producer. But anyway, um, last question. What is the view of the risk of uh, disease being transmitted between farm, farmed and wild salmon? One of the points is escapees are mixing with wild salmon. Uh, is, that a, is that the case or not? Well, so, so one of the things is so we are, f we are farming a, a effectively <coughs> something that isn't very far from a wild fish and it's in its normal habitat, so that the wild fish and the farmed fish will tend to have the same diseases in the first place. We're not moving a, a, an exotic species into a place it's not been before, so it can't bring in um, exotic diseases. It tends to be that the wild fish and the farmed fish have the same diseases. Um, the potential then for introducing a disease to the wild population I, I think is low. I think in the reports they highlight um, incidences where aquaculture in the world has introduced diseases, but that tends to be by feeding um, trash fish, so unprocessed trash fish that might carry pathogens to farmed fish. Obviously that doesn't happen here. We have very high quality fish feeds and they're, they're absolutely sterile. So, so we don't have that problem and we don't, we're not, there are very good controls on movement of salmon um, about and on um, the ability to move um, fish with health problems around in Europe or elsewhere. So my impression is that, that it's not really a big risk and people who have looked at that do not find a, a high risk of transfer of diseases. Now the the question of sea lice is a slightly different one in that if you have more fish in an area, it is true that they're likely to, um, if, if they have, say, sea lice, rather, they may shed more pathogens and that might um, produce more pressure. But I don't think they will introduce new diseases into the wild populations or necessarily that the level of introduction um, will have a big impact. That, that goes really on a case-by-case -case basis, I think. Thank you. So just before we move from that, I, I, I actually attended the, one of the Eclair committee meetings when the, the, the issue that Richard has highlighted uh, came up, which is the, the amount of deaths um, that, that occur, and, and that maybe that's masked by natural harvesting. And, and certainly the uh, SS, uh, uh, SSPO said that, that when fish show uh, likelihood of getting disease, they harvest them to prevent that d d d disease developing. So there was, you know, the disease never naturally came to fruition. 
Um, and I think that was the point that Richard was driving at. And I'd just like to clarify, are you saying that is not the case, or are you saying that that is the case, and, and that these fish, some of the fish that may be harvested may have disease, or they're starting to get disease? Well, I, I, don't, I have to say I don't know the details of that, so I certainly can't say that that's not the case, but certainly in terms of fish welfare, fish, uh, um, any fish that were... Um, showed signs of developing a disease that was going to be a welfare problem would be harvested out, is my impression, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, emergency harvest is happening. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think there is any question there. Um, and I think this is uh, also very important and a duty for fish farmers to make sure that uh, they don't actually keep fish that will have potentially uh, welfare um, uh, issues. I think the main reason why also it is done is that we're coming back to the environmental side, uh, links to the warming, climate change potentially, is that there, it's very multifactorial, and the gills are extremely important in the fish, and the gills are attacked continuously by phytoplankton potentially, which is more usual these days, uh, by amoeba, like a GD, which is relatively new in Scotland, we have to say also, which is maybe explaining uh, some of the difficulty and the challenges that the industry is, exp is experiencing. Um, so a number of different factors are going to have an impact on inflammation of the gills to the point where fish welfare will become an issue because you wouldn't then treat fish that already have uh, gills that are to a level which they would probably not cope with the treatment. So it's not that the fish are sick is that one of the main organs and tissues that they have that help them <laughs> uh, to, to have a normal swimming behavior and be uh, in, a, in a good uh, health are not in a condition that will allow them to cope with the treatment. So that's really where the problem is. So then at this stage, yeah, of course, you, you harvest is important. You, you have to harvest. But also, in some cases, I think it's important to stress out, is that the market for salmon is not only big five, six kilo uh, gram salmon. There's a market also for smaller fish. So you have a proportion of fish that are harvested, which has been planned all the way along, at two kilo, two and a half kilo, because the consumer, or the retailers, wants this product. So that, that's also, way. so it's quite difficult to actually tease out all these, uh, all these effects. An important point from the <coughs> economic side here is that uh, Scotland is one of relatively small number of companies, countries in the world that can farm salmon because of the, the sea uh, con conditions. And if it's the case that uh, the warming uh, of, of the water is making things more difficult or more expensive, um, it's very good then that you've got companies um, that are so profitable that can put the money into trying to make things as good as they can. So I think some, you know, these, these points that have been made about uh, diseases and how they're treated and so on, the, the, the companies uh, put huge amounts of money in because it's in, in their interest to protect it. And the fact that, for me, they're profitable is very favourable because if they were struggling at the margin to make their business work, then they wouldn't be able to afford to, um, to spend that kind of money. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next <coughs> question. Colin, uh, that's you. Now, um, can I move the discussion specifically on to the issue of, of sea lice and ask the panel what your understanding is of, of the impact of sea lice on, first of all, farm fish health and well-being, but also on wild salmonoids as a result of the, the transfer of sea lice um, from fish farms? That, uh, James. That's probably me, yeah. Um, so, in terms of, I mean, it, it's entirely context-dependent, really. So, many farms... Um, may have no problems with sea lice at all, and therefore there will be no effect on, on, on fish health. There are, there are sites that have serious problems with sea lice, and those will have an impact on fish health. Um, but, but mostly, um, sea lice are under control in Scotland, and as I said, if you look at the data that's been produced, there's been no rise in sea lice. So I think that there's a... 
an impression that there's been a, a sort of skyrocketing of sea louse numbers. But actually, if you look at the average, that's, that's remained relatively static there. And, and to do that, that's very difficult. So as, we, as I've said, because of these gill problems and other problems with treating, to manage to stay on top of that is quite a feat. And so I think the reports sort of suggest that the, the industry has just sat, sat back. And in fact, they, I think there's been more more innovation and more development of tools for, for treating sea lice in the last, say, five years than there has been across a much longer period, uh, so that they are very much concerned with sea lice and, and being effective in treating them. So they, are, they do have impacts on farmed fish, and if you get a lot of sea lice on a fish, obviously that will be very serious. So they can cause lesions on the fish, um, and those lesions will obviously impact welfare directly, but it can also be portals of entry, ways of other pathogens getting in, and also the sea lice have effects on the fish um, that may help other pathogens. So in terms of wild fish is the other question, that's really very difficult to, um, as I said before, to get a grip on because you don't get to see wild fish mortalities and you don't necessarily get to see um, wild fish with health challenges so even even in the in in the normal course of events without any fish farming um, wild fish can get very high numbers of sea lice so it would be normal for wild fish even in the absence of any farming to have a prevalence of 70 to 100 percent that is to say 70 percent of fish will be infected with sea lice and because wild fish um, returning to the coast, or at least for salmon, are quite large. They can have large numbers of sea lice on them without impacting their health at all. So in terms of working out an effect on wild fish, that's extremely difficult to do and, and either needs an enormous sampling effort, which there isn't at the moment, or it's very hard to predict that. I don't know if I've answered your question there. I think I think think you have. I don't know if any other members of the panel want to add anything. Well, I was going to come back on specifically the treatment of sea lice, but I'll wait to see if other members of the panel wish to respond to the initial question. Yeah. So, uh, with, um, our, 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 insofar as sea lice was concerned, our, our report, the SRSL report, was looking at published scientific ev evidence. Uh, so it isn't necessarily completely up to date so far as trends are concerned. Uh, and just to summarise, what we've, we found was that we couldn't find definitive evidence in Scotland, but in Norway there is definitive evidence that sea lice from farm salmon are having an impact on wild salmon populations. Uh, the, if I can read you something, the... Um, this is a Norwegian summary. You know, 101 stations investigated along the Norwegian coast for salmon lice infection. 27 indicated moderate to high likelihood of mortality for salmon smolts. And 67 stations indicated moderate to high mortality of wild sea trout. So. Um, but I, I should say that, that, that it's a very different issue looking in Norway. They're entirely different circumstances, different farming practices, so that the evidence doesn't exist for that in Scotland, as you say. Yeah. Uh, Colin, before we move on, Peter wants to come in briefly. Uh, I'll bring in Peter and then come straight back to you. If I may. Uh, thanks. It's, it's in response to your, your earlier answer, James, you said that some sites have a huge problem with, with sea lice and others have none. Um, does that mean that we should be looking at moving these, the aye, abandoning the sites that have a huge problem and moving these uh, when I to, say to a better huge sites. Yeah, I should say, I should um, define that more clearly. So then some sites, just because of their, their um, position or the sea conditions, tend to have, especially if they've got high freshwater input, will have no lice. Other ones will, will commonly have lice. But it doesn't mean this is, this is not controllable. It's just that they'll tend to be um, generally infected with lice. And, and other aspects of farming practice may increase or decrease the number of lice. Um, high, also waters with high, um, high currents tend to get less lice. Waters where, where you're, it's much more static, you'll tend to get more lice. But I mean, it mm. So it, 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 so wouldn't, it wouldn't be a, a reason to abandon certain sites because of that, the sea lice issue. You would say that it's, it's I, I, still I controllable. Just, so, so I don't know the, the sites individually, so, but um, 
if, if there were a serious problem, they'd have been abandoned already. So, so in the past, there have been sites that have experienced really high louse problems, and it tends to be that sites like that get weeded out because they're not, they're not productive, you have fish welfare problems, and they're just not, not useful to the industry. So those have mostly gone now. I think in the early years, there were sites like that, mm. but now those have most, mostly been weeded out. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, just before I bring you in, Richard, I think you've got a supplementary and, and it may help link the two. So. Yeah, just, just quickly, it's been suggested that escaped salmon is infecting wild salmon. Is that the case? Or causing disease in wild salmon? Is that the case? I'm not, I think there's no evidence to show that and, and I, I'm not aware of, it, of anything like that in Scotland. So it's a total fallacy that escaped salmon is infecting wild salmon? Well, I mean, the first question is infecting them with what? Well, you tell me. You're so the I can't, expert, so not me. As, as I say, <laughs> I, I personally don't know of any evidence of that. Thank you. Can I, can I come in there? Uh, again with the Norwegian evidence is that there is, the Norwegians concluded there was a very low transmission of disease from escaped wild salmon, escaped farm salmon to wild salmon. Uh, before I bring you in, I think you want to follow up. So, Sorry, you very rude. The deputy convener wants to follow up on, on one question uh, on an answer that I think you gave, uh, Paul. Yeah, no, I was interested in, you were talking about the um, correlation between what's happening in Norway and you said that there can't be any comparison between how they do it in Norway and what, what happens in Scotland. What, what are the differences? How do they do it differently and why can't they be compared? Um, sorry. Um, yeah, so no, I, I didn't. You might want to say something about the differences in practice. The, the, there is a difference in the environment. Um, in Norway, has much bigger, deeper fjords. Most Scottish sea lochs are comparatively small compared with that. Um, Norwegian waters uh, typically are colder, um, particularly those in northern Norway. Uh, but um, I think then one would have to go into specific details of conditions in particular fjords and particular locks to try and understand whether there were, were differences, real differences between Scotland and Norway. And one of the things actually I would like to pick up on from this, this discussion is this very notion of specificity. Of, you know, it's, we talk about sea locks, um, but locks like Scottish rivers are all are very different one from, from the other. It's very important to understand the local conditions to, to understand what might be responsible for a higher um, incidence of, say, sea lice or mortality in one, in one lock. It would depend not only on average water currents, which vary from lock to lock, but also on what you might think of as a weather in the, the sea, which can change. And it might, it might happen that a farm is unlucky because it happens to be exposed to infection by a lot of sea lice larvae in a particular week because the main currents are flowing from a particular direction, a farm a little way down the coast might escape uh, but might pick up an infection in a, in, in a subsequent year. So what, one of the, the mitigation points I want to make is just is we, we need better to understand this marine weather and the way sea lice larvae are transmitted around and reinfect sites. So, I think you, so, you, so, you were so there, there's a difference in scale. They, they have much larger cages on the whole. Um, the, the feeding regimes may de be different, and the things and the um, what they're trying to get out as a product is different as well. I think there are differences um, for whatever reason in, in terms of the numbers of escapees entering rivers, which seems to be um, very small in Scotland, but it seems to be very high in. Norway, so there are um, differences in the industry. There, there are cages in Norway, so this is not throughout the industry, but there are cages in Norway that I think would be very difficult to sustain in Scotland just because of the scale of them. So, so I think there are substantial differences. Norway produces 15 times more salmon than Scotland, so it gives you some idea about the differences in condition. I think we also need to consider when we say Norway, we have to be careful. Norway has an extended coastline, and the conditions in the north are very different than the conditions in the south. So it's not really like so much Norway. We have to look at geographical area, and even so, you have a lot of local differences that will potentially explain why data cannot really be applied directly in Scotland. 
So, so the temptation to uh, say in Norway has been shown this, and then it would apply directly to somewhere on the West Coast is high, but I think scientifically it's not always the best thing to do. Okay, I'm coming back to Colin now. Um, that, that's going to, can, can I turn then to how we try to treat um, the problem, whatever the scale of it uh, is? Um, there's different trigger levels um, at the moment um, on when um, CLA should be treated. Industry code of practice is, is different from um, the, the, the policy from Marine Scotland. So is there a scientific basis for a trigger, trigger level at which point CLA should be actually treated? Sorry, salmons should be treated for CLA. So to be honest, even for the, so there's, as you say, there are two levels there. Um, um, one which, which um, looks to take action when you get three lice, um, three adult females, I should say, and one where you have specific action at a level of eight. And then the code of good practice um, has values of 0 0.5 and one adult female per fish. And that 0 0.5 and 1 and values like that are similar to those used in the world industry. But, but nowhere was that a scientifically established number. That was effectively a handy small integer that lets you easily count it and, and say, well, we're keeping lice low now. So then if everyone sticks to that number that will tend to keep lice low. But as far as I'm aware, there's been no scientific support for that number. So there, there are good and bad points to these trigger levels. And I should say that in, in Scotland, really, they are decision levels. In some countries, they are mandatory, and you have to treat. And that's very dangerous, because if you, if you have to treat every time you see a small number of lice, it means you have to repeatedly treat with drugs, and because the, li the lice get uh, resistant to veterinary medicines, the more you treat, the more likely are they are to develop resistance, then the, the sort of mandatory treatment whenever you see a louse is a very dangerous practice. The other problem with trigger levels is, if you drop to these very low numbers, you can't actually truly establish that statistically without sampling a very, very large number of fish, an unsustainably large number of fish, every time you want to sample. The smaller that cutoff point gets, so if you drop it to, and some countries do, to 0.1 adult females per fish, say, you can't realistically sample that. And so there's, there's also a balance between the, these trigger levels and what you can actually truly measure um, on a farm in, in real time, as it were. Mm -hmm. so, so it's quite a com complex issue, that. I don't know if that answered your question. I, I, think, I think, yeah, I think it does answer. I think no was, was is it the wrong about answer in terms of the scientific basis, but it's interesting to see the, 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 uh, the background to, to those particular trigger levels. Uh, looking at specifically what action can be taken to, to, to treat um, sea lice that the Clear Committee suggested, uh, I've got the quote here, there may be greater scope for growing smokes to a larger size in close containment in RES and transferring the fish to net pens for the final year of production only, and this might reduce the sea lice problem. Is that proposal, do you think, something that's feasible? And what other actions should we be taking to tackle sea lice? And I suppose, finally, um, do you think the problem itself can be tackled? So I do, I, there's, there's a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to talk yes, about sir. the risk. The, yes, I can. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so the, the use of a containment system and recirculation is, is already done um, in Norway. <clears throat> and it's been coming in Scotland. Uh, meaning that uh, rather than transferring smolt the seawater adapted to open cages, they are transferred to recirculation system in seawater where they're going to be ungrown for a longer period of time, and that will be reducing the time the fish spend in open cages, which of course reduce also the risk uh, in terms of our health challenges. So Scotland is also developing in the industry uh, this approach. So that, that's something that is definitely uh, happening. I think this is one of the many different strategies that have been developed over the last uh, 10 years. Um, when you look at what happened since 2002, where there was the report, to today, is a huge amount of innovation. And the industry has been extremely proactive in developing a lot of these. Some of them were new concepts to start with, but now they're fully implemented commercially. So there's a, when we look at the integrated pest management strategy, 
used to be um, based mainly on things like area management, following, so a number of things like this. Now it would include, and chemotherapy terms, sorry. Uh, now it would include also the use of clinfish. It would use also uh, preventive measures, like the use of skirts around the cages. Um, it would also um, uh, include uh, lighting systems that can actually keep fish away from the sea lice, which are mainly in the surface layer. Um, it would include uh, snorkel. Um, I don't know if you heard about this, but it's, again, to keep the fish lower down uh, in the water column. Um, I mean, it would include so many different technology. Uh, one of them being tested at the moment is called uh, uh, optical delusing, which is using laser system, which has been developed in Norway, and it's now full commercially testing uh, at the moment. Um, there is really, um, I'm losing, I'm, I'm missing a few of them, functional feeds. Um, so obviously the feed manufacturer has been now developing a lot of new innovative um, uh, diets that will include additives that can also uh, try to boost mucus production, for example, and, and reduce um, uh, sea lice attachment or boost immune function of the fish. It means that they cook better and they can defend themselves better against some of the disease. So I think all of these strategies have been developed over the last 10 years. Some of them are commercially implemented today. Most farmers are using them. Some are still not in a proof of concept, but still to be refined. And, and every time you bring a new solution or a new technology, you also bring some challenges with it. And it would take some time in terms of research to make sure that we optimize all the conditions. Uh, one of the other methodology used at the moment is bath treatment, as you know, with fresh water. Um, some of the companies invested uh, in well boats with reverse osmosis that they can produce their own fresh water, which is pretty difficult to do. Um, so I think, I think it's quite uh, amazing. Uh, and the other one also, warm bath treatment, which is very, very new. It's been used in the industry now uh, recently without problems to start with. But I think today it's showing actually it's working pretty well. So I think the innovation in the industry, I think, is quite fantastic. Colin, do you want to follow that up? It's difficult to follow that one. Yeah, yeah. If you can just repeat that list again. No, it does seem there's, a, there's an extensive amount of work going, going on. So are you confident that the problem itself can therefore be tackled, given that list that you provided? It is being tackled successfully at the moment. And, the, and this idea of integrated pest management, where you, you bring a, a very diverse range of tools to attack the problem. So in the past, it might have been simply veterinary medicines were used, and then you wouldn't do anything else. Then more recently, veterinary medicines and then farm management tools, following area management agreements, um, um, positioning of cages, stocking questions, genetics, uh, we didn't really talk about. So genetically resistant fish is another thing that's been worked on. Um, so all these tools together will have a very good chance of managing the lice. And I think we are getting a handle on that, because as Hervey says, most, many of these new techniques have only really appeared commercially in the last maybe three to five years, and so they're effectively bedding down. And the other problem is, very rarely do people use one technique. They're using five techniques or maybe ten techniques at the same time, and at the moment we therefore don't have the statistical evaluation of how one given technique will work. And the another problem is that farms are very diverse in terms of their, um, their environmental context, how they're run, the number of fish on them, a whole range of things. The farms are very diverse, so it's not easy to say, well, this farm has technology X and this farm has technology Y and this is a superior technology because they both will have overlapping technologies and may have um, individual differences. It's very difficult to get those numbers at the moment. But that will, will come out in time, but I think at the moment there's a lot of different tools being used and we are working out which are the best ones and also what are the best ways to use them. So it's not simply having the tools, but knowing when to treat the fish and also, as, as we've said before, with these gill problems as well, that makes a, a, um, the whole question a bit more difficult. Thank you, James. I'm just conscious there's quite a lot of questions here still to go through. And, and Colin, I'm going to move on uh, to, to Gail Ross for the next two questions. 
Thank you, Convener. I want to move on to a more environmental side of things and to um, quote a paragraph from the Eclair Committee's report. They say that they're uh, deeply concerned that it appears a precautionary approach has not been and is not being applied to the development of fish farms and in particular farms in marine protected areas or in the vicinity of a priority marine feature. Is there any research that considers the impact of fish farms located near MPAs or PMFs and do you think this is an area of concern? That's one, oh, one for me, you. yes. So uh, we weren't able to find very much in the way of published papers for, for Scotland. They, they, I think the most significant one concerned um, potential impacts on marl beds, which are these meadows of slow-growing um, calcareous red, red seaweed. Uh, the, my, my, my feeling is that there probably is a lot of evidence out there uh, um, re resulting from monitoring of the protected areas and, and features. Uh, what we need is some way of assimilating, synthesising that, that information um, to determine uh, whether there is a significant effect on marine protected areas. Uh, I, I know I hear anecdotally from fish farmers that they're beginning to be reluctant to, to apply for licences um, in or near marine protected areas uh, simply because they find it too complicated and protracted a, a business to demonstrate that the farm activity might be compatible. Uh, and so one of, one of the issues about talking marine protected areas in general is that we're talking about a wider range of habitats and species um, and some of them might be perfectly compatible with uh, salmon farming activity and others, others won't. Um, and some we know something about and some, some we don't. One particular interest of mine is in seagrass meadows, um, which were probably flourishing around Scotland 100 years ago, seem to have... Um, a lot of them have disappeared in the last two or three gener generations. Uh, these may or may not be sensitive to fish farming in Scotland. There's certainly a concern in the Mediterranean, but uh, I don't think we know enough ab about, about them to take that as one specific example. Um, yeah, so to sum that up, I think we, we should start with an attempt to bring together what is already known <laughs> about fish farming in relation to protected areas. Uh, I think that would be a relatively simple task. Okay. Um, so, so what considerations do you think should be taken into consideration currently if there's an application for a fish farm in an MPA? Um, well, I think typically the uh, application or the, the regulators will look at the benthic impact. So they'll look at the footprint of the cage on the seabed um, and basically ask, is that going to affect the, the feature that's protected on the, on the seabed? Uh, how far do you think um, concerns of the local community would be taken into consideration? So the local, the local people. Yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, that's that's getting into the issue of social license rather than environmental li license now. And I th actually think it is important to distinguish those 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 two. I think, in, in many ways, this, despite some of the evidence that the Environment Committee heard, I think a lot of the environmental aspects you know, are reasonably well con controlled. But there clearly are many issues around the perception of these uh, environmental effects of, of salmon farming. Um, and so one way of putting this is that people interpret these effects depending on their own story of what they expect. So for, pe for people who see fish farming as a source of employment are very happy to see fish farms there, then they'll tell the story about environmental effects in one way. Th those who appreciate, say, the highlands as an area of natural beauty and think of it as pristine um, react much more strongly against fish, fish, fish farming. Uh, so, I mean, these are, these, are, these are factual things. People are behaving in these two distinct ways. These oppositional things are getting more intense and we know again from Norway where there's also been research on this that they're beginning to polarise coastal uh, com communities. So uh, I think we have to be aware of perception of environmental effects as well as 
environmental effects itself. And I suspect that came through in some of the evidence to the Environment Committee in, in terms of criticisms of the agencies as to whether they're doing their job or not doing their job. Um, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, can I move on to um, depositional zone regulation? And uh, you'll be aware that SEPA has proposed and consulted on new regulations relating to deposits on the seabed. And um, again, to go back to the Eclair Committee report, they state that they understand that the new DZR being consulted uh, seems to allow the expansion of fish farms in more exposed locations while requiring the tightening of the monitoring of nutrient waste. And these proposals will be brought forward by the end of June this year. The committee is also concerned that the new proposed model has not been peer reviewed. There's a lack of scientific evidence and published evidence to support the model. So what, um, in terms that we will understand, are the advantages and disadvantages of the depositional zone regulations proposed by SEPA? And how do you think that this would affect the economics and the environmental impact of fish farming in Scotland? I can answer all of that, but I can tell you a bit about depositional <laughs> pro 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 problems. Um, and I'm not going to be claiming to be completely familiar with the details of the regulations. But if you imagine a, 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 a cage farm in very quiet waters, then the fish wastes, the, the uneaten food and the faeces will settle down on the seabed directly underneath the, the, the cage. Uh, so there's an obvious footprint under those conditions. And uh, in the early days of fish farming, that caused considerable problems because the decaying material gave rise to bubbles of gas that rose to the sur surface, and it really was a pub public horror. So that's been regulated for the last few, few, few decades by an allowable zone of effect. So in effect, SEPA says to a fish farm, right, you're allowed to have an effect on the seabed within a prescribed area, um, two conditions that the you must stay the effect must be contained and secondly you must not kill everything off in that area so there has to be a minimum number of species remaining in that area so that, that works very well um, in quiet waters and that limits that limits the size of a farm in waters where there's little little turbulence um, but there has been a move to try and encourage farms to move offshore into more active, more energetic environments with stronger currents. Uh, and in the extreme case, these currents might be so strong that there is no footprint on the seabed because all the waste material is deposited over a much wider air area. So the question then becomes, well, how do we regulate that wider Im impact? Um, how, uh, and that's where I think the new regulations are, are aimed at. So they could potentially allow for larger farms, but in more dispersive waters and with less uh, intense impact on the seabed. So the question there is then, um, it's a question of the health of the seabed community over wider areas. So you might say in, in the past we've been um, willing to write off two or three percent of the seabed of a lock, knowing that once the area is fallowed, it will recover. Right? Uh, and all the evidence is, is this has little effect on the overall health of the seabed community. I think we, we have a less clear idea of what will happen on this larger scale if we have amounts of material which don't make an obvious impact locally, but are distributed over a wider area. Sorry, Steve, just before you bring, can I bring Stuart with a brief follow-up and then I'll bring you in and, and bring anyone else in that, that's appropriate. Um, in relation to the faecal deposits, which is essentially what we're talking about, are they a potential disease vector? Um, I I, I guess better answered by him. Potentially, yes, but I, I, don't, I don't think in, in that you, if they are depositing faeces, well, with pathogens in them, chances are that they, the fish have pathogens and therefore um, they'd be dispersing pathogens into the environment anyway. So I don't think they're more of a disease vector than just having a lot of, of fish there in the first place. They, they may carry, you mean in terms, I mean, so even if the faeces got carried down loch, so would the pathogens in the water. So I don't think they're, they're a particular disease vector in those terms. 
Steve, you wanted to come in on that. Just on the economic side, um, if we look at uh, existing production sites and sites that have gone through planning and will be coming into operation in the next few years, the feedback we got from all of the companies was that their expectation of, of these LR changes will be strongly positive in, in, in terms of the sites where they will be able to um, uh, grow and harvest more fish will outweigh the ones quite significantly where there'll be a loss. But that, that's their understanding, you know, based on their own modelling. I, I, I might have misunderstood what you said there. Could you just repeat that again? Just well, so in the, yeah, in relation to the sites, the carrying capacity of, of, of sites currently, that the companies um, are, are expecting the new regulations to mean that a number of the current sites, plus the sites that are coming on stream, as it were, in the next few years, will give them quite a strong increase in the amount of fish that they can harvest and that that will much more than outweigh sites where it might work the other way. Okay. Uh, James, I'll, br I'll bring you in briefly because I, I want to... Short comment, but also, um, different technologies are reducing the amount that gets um, deposited because now, in the past, you might have just thrown feed in for, um, and, and anything that was uneaten fell to the bottom. Now there are sort of on-demand systems, so you can monitor fish feeding so that all the food or a lot of the food should be eaten in those ways. And there are other techniques for... Um, they're, they're developing techniques to detect whether fish are feeding or not, and those are also being used to reduce the waste matter that will fall beneath the cages. OK, thank you. I think I'm going to move on to the next question, uh, which is uh, John Finney, as you. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning. It still is morning. Uh, panel, thank you. I'd like to ask about medicines and chemicals, please, including uh, synthetic chemicals, antibiotics, and the concerns that have been expressed about the, farm, uh, the, the harm to other organisms and indeed the ecosystem. Now, the, our sister committee uh, expressed concern about a data gap, and we've heard that repeatedly, that there, there are gaps in some of the information. They also expressed some concerns uh, um, about SEPA permitting the discharge of priority substances and damaging substances. And if I just give you a, a quote um, from their letter to us, it's not tenable for SEPA to adopt a position where commercial shellfish species are impacted by day-to-day -day activities of fish farms. So can I ask about research about discharge and the effect on shellfish farming, please? Yeah, yes. Um, well, the evidence in the present day um, does not show any harmful effects of salmon farming on shellfish farming. I think what, what, what people should have in the back of their mind is history about tributyl tin, the, uh, the a compound called tributyl tin, which was used as an anti-fouling compound uh, oh, um, and, and until about 20 years ago. Uh, so it was, it was used on fish farm nets. Uh, it proves to have a very harmful effect on, on um, invertebrates. Uh, it causes them to change sex amongst other things. Um, and this did, the use of this anti-fouling compound in some fish farms did have a very harmful effect on shellfish farms. That was a documented case. It, it led to a very large change in the regulation. So this compound is no longer used. But I think that is what is in the back of shellfish farmers' minds now, knowing the range of compounds that are used in fish, in fish farming. Uh, but I mean, to the best of my knowledge, what, what could be found out from the published literature is that there is some concern about the compound imamectin, which is used in feed uh, as a treatment for sea lice on salmon. Some of the imamectin gets to the seabed through faeces and then is redistributed um, through biological and physical pro processes. Um, and there is beginning to be some concern that it's having diffuse effects on some of the organisms that naturally live in the seabed, the uh, crustaceans and worms, for example. Uh, but that seems to be confined to the community on the seabed at depths of 20, 30, 40 metres, rather than most uh, shellfish farms are either seashore, oysters um, in intertidal waters, or mussels on ropes going down perhaps to 10 metres. Uh, and if I may, w w would you uh, have concerns then if you're saying, albeit 20, 30 metres down, it seems that the ecosystem is being impacted? Um, so it's, 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 it depends how precautionary I 
I, I want I wanted to be. I, I would say I think. I, yeah, I, I think there's an urgent need to get more evidence about about this. The one study, a detailed st statistical investigation, has been committed, commissioned, carried out by funding from the Scottish Agricultural Research Forum, um, and that did lead to some suggestions that there were correlations between decline in the benthic community, some distance from fish farms, and the amount of emomectin used on the farm. Um, but one of the, dif the difficulties with that is the nature of the data that was being compared was not collected for the purpose of looking at the effect of emomectin. Um, so we probably do, do need a proper study uh, of the effects of emomectin on benthic communities. Um, th th thank you for that. Um, and all the committees I've sat on in here, I've never had of academics, I don't suggest that the world will be better placed for more research, um, and perhaps not surprising. But has this been mapped out, the gaps that do exist in, in all these issues that people have concerns about? It may be that that research could allay some concerns, but um, I mean, people have genuine concerns, and indeed you've expressed some yourself. Is there any template anywhere of what would require to be done to fill the gaps in the research? Well, I think there is in the um, Environment Committee's re re report, there is a summary of the areas that need more research um, in relation to salmon farming. Uh, my, 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 um, summary? Um. Broadly, yeah, yeah, yes. Um, I, I, th I think you, you, might, you, you, might, you, you might also ask the Scottish Agricultural Research Forum um, to give you evidence on this, because they are the body which has tried to bring together funding sources from government and industry and identify what areas of research are priority. Okay. So they have a small budget, but so they, they are strongly focused on what they see as the priority areas. I, th I think there, there are also areas of research that, that are not identified in here, so really I think it needs a, a larger... Um, discussion with academia and industry and indeed um, government and NGOs to identify the key um, gaps in knowledge that need to be filled. But there, as you can see from the report, especially for Scotland, there are many, many gaps that do need to be filled. Yeah. I think if I could also add, um, the Scottish Aquaculture Innovation Centre um, has actually been providing a, a critical um, link between industry and uh, academics around key concerns um, uh, with impact um, and challenges in the industry. So there's been quite a lot of different issues that have already been mapped out, and some of these are already being researched today through a number of uh, uh, co-funded projects through SEC and the industry. Um, and the other one is also there's a big initiative that started uh, recently, um, supported by BBSRC and NERC, uh, called Arch UK, which is focusing on aquaculture, which is bringing all scientists um, uh, pretty much around the UK together around uh, aquaculture and salmon farming and trying to identify all the gaps in the knowledge that need to be addressed um, at the level of the production, but the environment also, the nutrition. So a lot of the challenges that we're discussing about, um, there is a lot of meetings and forums happening to try to really make sure that we can create the critical mass to address this. Thank you very much. Can I, can I just uh, admit to uh, struggling with time now, which is probably because I've let everyone uh, say as much as they want, so I'm going to have to be a bit tighter on time. I apologise for that. Uh, Donald, you wanted to ask a brief question, and then I'm going to go on to Peter Chapman. And if I could just ask the panel members to, to try and work with me. I have tried to sign a couple of times, and, and you studiously ignored me. Um, probably uh, I'm going to have to ask you not to ignore me now. Donald. Thank you, Convener. Um, one of the concerns of the Eclair Committee was um, the uh, fact that freshwater um, ecosystems uh, perhaps deserved a little more focus. Um, your report quite plainly focused on the marine environment um, in the majority of the areas that it looked at, but I just wondered if you had any observations on environmental impacts in freshwater systems. Um, everyone's looking the other way. Um, I, I, I say, Paul, I'm going to let you, you, you speak on that, and then I'm going to move on to Peter's question, because I see no one else wants to. Paul. Uh, 
Uh, well, I'll just say, as a marine biologist, and I have no direct expertise, but what, what, one of the concerns in freshwater is the supply of fresh water, um, particularly for um, hatcher hatcheries, which require a, a reasonably large and constant supply of fresh water. Um, even recirculating systems have to replace some of their water each, each day. And that in itself might be an issue that needs to be taken account of, particularly in the context of the Water Framework Directive um, and its transpositions into Scottish law. Donald, I, I think we're going to leave that there. And I'm going to ask Peter to lead on the next question. And uh, Peter. Um, my, my question is about cleaner fish, lump suckers and wrasse, an increase in demand for, for both these species. Um, my, the, 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 the direct question is how effective are these uh, species in, in addressing sea lice? And the increasing demand for these species, can we farm them? Or if we can't farm them, what effect is it having on the, the wild populations of these fish? in that we now catch them in, in large numbers to, to feed this industry. So yes, we can definitely farm them. Um, there are some large collaborative projects that have been running now over many years. Um, I'm not saying there's no challenges. Uh, both Balanras and Lumsucker are entirely new species for aquaculture. So it's, um, the process was about fast-tracking domestication, uh, which took a long time in other species. But a lot of progress has been made over the last seven years. Um, maybe I could give you the example that it's only in 2013, so less than five years ago, that the first eggs were obtained in captive broodstock in commercial hatchery. So it's only from less than five years, which is actually quite small, um, considering all the, the different things that you need to look at. So a lot of work's been done in how to feed them, in how to breed them, um, in how to keep them healthy. Um, and now a lot of focus is still looking at some of the pathogens that are bacterial infection that need vaccines to be developed. There's already vaccines that have been um, prototyped, that have been testing at the moment. So I guess without going too much in details, um, yes, it can be farmed. Um, like most other marine species um, that have been farmed. Uh, Atlantic cod, when it was um, uh, produced in the UK, uh, some of the hatcheries were producing two million, two and a half million juveniles, uh, and they were healthy. So there's no reason why we're not going to be able to produce enough farm healthy ras uh, to supply the industry. Now the question will be when, and I know this is, <laughs> um, I'm not even going to try to tell you when. Uh, I think it needs a bit more time uh, because there are still a few challenges regarding robustness of these fish. Uh, before they're deployed, they need to be addressed. So, I mean, in the meantime, we're catching wild wrasse and lump sucker. And uh, what effect do you feel this is having on the wild population of these fish? So, I cannot really comment myself too much on the wild um, uh, fish impact. What I can say is that we're not in a position where we will, or the industry will, have farm wrasse and farm lump sucker. This is a reality has already been going. So a percentage of the total cleaner fish that have been supplied, uh, especially over the last two years and this year, is coming from farming operation. Now, um, the aspiration for the industry is to be able to have a full supply from commercial farm uh, cleaner fish uh, as soon as possible. Um, and as I said, it will probably take another couple of years at least. Um, but we are already very well advanced. And when I say we, is because this is a very good example of collaboration between industry and academia. And, and at the Institute, we've been actually working quite a lot with a lot of the farmers to develop all these protocols and understand the biology of the species. Okay, so the, the basic question then is how effective are these cleaner fish in, in addressing the sea lice issue? So this is where we started our research uh, back seven, eight years ago. Uh, that was the key questions. Everybody had concern. Are they really effective? They are extremely effective. Bannon Ross um, is, um, is actually very impressive <laughs> in the way it can prey on the sea lice. Now, it doesn't mean that they are all the time effective when they are deployed in cages, because there are many other factors that can impact on the fish. Uh, that's where the environmental 
factors can come in, and it took a long time also to understand what are the requirements of the species when they are in the cage. So now a lot of new uh, methods have been developed to uh, provide shelters, for example, to provide feeding that is appropriate to the species, um, and understand their behavior. So, um, so yeah, they are very, very effective. Uh, Ballon brass is extremely effective. And we've done a lot of experimental tank challenge, um, demonstrating and publishing this now for many years. And cleaner fish also can be very effective, um, but maybe not as much as Ballon Ross. Um, and this is explaining why uh, the ratio of lump sucker that are introduced in cages is a little bit higher than what you would do for Ballon Ross. Um, the, other, the other thing to consider, sorry, I'm just going to finish there, is that you have uh, temperature requirements that are different, or preference. So lump sucker are extremely active during winter, cold months, uh, while Ballon Ross are very active and efficient during summer months. So the two species together provide actually very good biological control um, in the industry. And you have sign in the industry, that's the last thing I would say, which works, which full cycle, production cycle, have been done without any treatments, chemotherapy treatments whatsoever, just by the use of the clean of fish. Thank okay. you, and Thank I am you. going to stop you there. The, uh, the next question is from Mike Rumbles, and then the one after will be from you, Phil. Thanks, Gunnar. Yeah, I'm going to focus on the appropriateness of the current regulatory system for the industry. And I was most impressed by the Environment Committee's report, 80-page, um, very effective report, I think. And I just want to quote you a couple of sentences from it, and I'd like your res response to this, bearing in mind about the appropriateness of the current regulatory system. The committee is not convinced the sector is being regulated sufficiently or effectively. There are too many regulators and too little effective regulation. And it went on to say, the committee is not convinced SEPA or any other agency is effectively monitoring the environmental impact of salmon fisheries. The committee is also not convinced that the regulations, protocols and options for enforcement and prosecution for the sector are appropriate and being appropriately deployed. Now, those are very strong sentiments of the members of the Environment Committee. And I'd like your reaction to it, please. Uh, I'm, going I'm going to ask Paul and James to, to answer that, that, that particular comment. So, Paul, would you like to kick off on that, please? So they, they, they are strong comments. I mean, I, I'm an ecologist, um, not, an ex, not an expert in regulation. Uh, I, I have been coordinating a European program called Aquaspace, uh, and one of the conclusions from that is that all across Europe, there's a general feeling that regulation is too complex uh, and too time-consuming. So clearly from both sides, uh, both sorts of perception, there is a need to improve on regulation, both to make it effective, but also to, to make it simple and efficient. Uh, it has to cope not only with the, what I'm interested in, ecological effects on the environment, it also has to be able to deal with public perceptions of what, of what the issues are. And I think this means um, that we need the regulators as, as the police, but we need to bring the public more into the process of monitoring to in, in, involve them in what I call, we call in the report adaptive management. Uh, so, so, there, so I'm trying to distinguish between whether the regulators are doing a good job and what the public perception of them is. James. This is not really my area of expertise as well. Uh, in particular areas, so in terms of oversight, I can't really um, speak, but I think one of the key things for the salmon industry is the availability of treatments for um, sea lice and for other pathogens. And I think there needs to be more careful consideration of what the best outcomes for the environment are in terms of allowing the use of drugs as well as preventing the use of drugs. So if you can protects the environment by, by using a drug that is nominally more harmful or give longer protection to the environment, these sort of wider questions need to be engaged with. And I think that's not really being done, as, from my point of view at least. Can I just ask, would you agree to the specific question, the environment, members of the Environment Committee are not convinced that SEPA or any other agency <coughs> is effectively monitoring the environment impact 
on salmon fisheries. Do you agree with that or do you disagree? Just yes or no from, from all four of you would be very helpful. I fear it's not that <laughs> simple. <laughs> The, the, there's always three answers, yes, no, and abstain. That's what we're given in the, in, in, in the chamber. So I'm delighted if you want to give one of those three answers as you've been directed. Yeah. So I think there is a lot of monitoring. What we don't do is synthesise the results of that monitoring. The agencies don't do that anymore. They used to. I don't, I don't think they have the resources to do it properly now. So, so that's a qualified yes. Would that be right? Yes. James, do you want to... Abstain? Yes, no. I think I'll I think in in some areas there is there is too much activity, and in some areas too little. So as a general picture, I you, I can't make a single statement. Okay, and I'm not going to put you all through the pain of that. I, I be in the same position, so I'd be tempted to say no, not because I don't agree entirely with it. Uh, I just think that it's maybe a simplification. In some area, there's actually quite a lot, maybe even too much. In some other area, maybe not enough. And the, the level or the amount of data now that is generated is so high that maybe it becomes difficult um, to look at them properly. Steve, do you want to? Abstain. Abstain, <laughs> OK. So I'm afraid you, you got some of your answers. We need, we need to move um, to the subject, which is never far from everyone's mind at the moment, Fulton. Yeah, thanks, Convener. And um, as Steve, you'd actually uh, mentioned it earlier, and, uh, and you were promised that we'd come back to the issue of Brexit, and, and here we are. So, uh, I mean, just to keep the, the, the question uh, brief, what, what are the most significant implications uh, of Brexit on the, the salmon industry? I think there are two, two, two aspects to this. One, one is uh, exports, the impact that Brexit might have on, on exports, and secondly is the one in terms of labour supply. I think if we take the, the export one, if we look at current productions or relatively modest increases in production that might happen in the next few years, in relation to world markets, there shouldn't be an issue of not being able to sell, to continue to sell all of the salmon that we can produce. But it might mean, or is likely to mean, a slight reduction in the profits uh, of the companies. So, for example, rather than saying to France, um, and, and where, where some of the premium products, as I mentioned earlier, are sold, uh, it means selling to another country and not making quite as much margin on it. Um, that could have a, a small uh, effect on uh, unemployment. It's been really interesting that the last few years, Marine Harvest have twice announced redundancy programs purely based on profitability of the overall company. They said, you know, we'll need to reduce our UK staff by such and such a number because we want to get back to the profit level. And then they've tried to work out how to do it. So there's this, there is a some link. But mainly, it, 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 the impact, I think, on employment will, will be small. Different maybe scenario if we look um, further ahead, and if, it, if the industry does manage to double or, or even have an increase of 50% on, it, on its current level, most of that will be exports because the home market will have been saturated by, by that time. So the challenge of Brexit and the way that the international companies manage it will, will, will grow. Um, if there's that increase. Uh, but by the time that increase happens, of course, we'll know a lot more than we do at the moment, and the companies will, will have their mechanisms. But um, I think the, you know, the, 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 the kind of most stable thing for the Scottish industry really is, is this question of, um, of, of demand exceeding supply. Uh, and when you look at the growth of companies like, uh, countries like China uh, and, and others where more and more people are, are buying um, products like salmon, that is likely to more than compensate for the Brexit effect, as it were, on, on exports. I think um, perhaps more worrying, though, is, is the labour supply one, particularly in, in processing, but in some of the other activities as well, that are relatively poorly paid, where the working conditions are not necessarily uh, that popular for the, um, for the Scottish uh, workforce. Um, there's a lot of worry there that... Um, that jobs will be lost. Now, there's been quite a lot of product, product as we show in our report, a lot of productivity improvements uh, in, in processing in recent years, and the, the momentum for that will grow with, with um, you know, Brexit impacts on labour supply. So we'll have more automation, more use of robots and such like, it, but it, it will help to sustain uh, those operations, even if employment does fall. But if we're looking at, um, you know, 
just from our own perspective um, in, in Scotland, in terms of the employment of Scottish people, then th those mechanisms will actually sustain those jobs in, into the longer term and there'll be less requirement for bringing people in uh, for, from other countries. But, um, what, I mean, no, nobody knows, of course, what, what mechanisms are going to come about. My own view as an economist looking across the board is, is that we'll have more and more people coming from African countries to do a lot of the jobs, um, the lower paid, less popular jobs that people, say, from uh, Romania are filling at the moment. I think mechanisms will, will come along, because uh, they always have done. If you look at it over the last 100 years, we've always had inflows of workers from, whether it's from Ireland or the Commonwealth. They're always, mechanisms are always found. Um, but uh, there could be a transition um, p period uh, on, on that one. I think on the farms, there's been a fairly interesting trend. Uh, not major, but there's been more um, overseas people working on farms than there were, say, 20 years ago. Uh, I, I, I would put that down to um, a large extent to what, what I found in other sectors, which is a, an increased reluctance of um, not just Scottish but British people wanting to work outside, whether we're looking at forestry, nurseries, fishing, agriculture, construction. Um, people more and more want to work inside, even though the rates of pay aren't necessarily even quite as good. So there would be some impact again on, on, the, um, uh, on, on, the, on the farms. Uh, I mean, farms only maybe employ a tenth of the impact in Scotland of, of, um, of, of salmon, so it's a bit less important than some of the other sectors. But I think this, um, this aspect again there of um, who, who will come in um, to fill those jobs. And it's not easy to put people up. I mean, there's problems in a lot of the outlying areas where the jobs are most needed, where there isn't really housing, e even for local people who might want to work. So there is an issue of accommodation <coughs> of people. I, 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 thanks, Kavita. I think that was a, a very detailed response on the possible implications of Brexit. Um, and I thank you for that. And I know we don't have time to um, discuss it today, but I was concerned but one of the things that you mentioned about working conditions uh, for people, particularly, I think you said, in processing. And I know we don't have time to maybe explore that in full today, but I hope that's something that we can maybe uh, look at more in the committee. Because to me, and I'm sure everybody uh, around the table agrees, it doesn't matter where you come from, the, your working conditions should be spot on. So I would, with the convener's permission, like to see maybe that come in, into the questioning in the future. I've, I've noted that comment, and we'll Thank see you. if we can work on that. Thanks very much for the response. Um, I have, a, I have one more question, and, and we are short of time. Um, so I think we've had quite a full answer, if I may. Um, I'd just like to try and wrap this up is in, in, in the, with a final question, in, in the sense that in 2016, my understanding is there were 163,000 tonnes of salmon produced. The target is in 2020 to go to 200,000 tonnes of salmon, and to 2030, 400,000 tonnes of salmon. And I noticed the SSPCO are saying that they are determined to see this growth achieved without detriment to our wider environment. My question to each of you, very briefly, if I may, are you convinced that these targets can be met without detriment to the wider environment, or are you not? And I'm very happy to start off with Paul on that. Um, well, yes, but there will need to be radical radical changes um, in the way uh, both um, the farming is managed and, reg and regulated. That's a very brief, succinct answer. James, uh, can you match that? Uh, I can't match it. I, I think, yes, yes, it can be achieved, but there's obviously a lot of problems that need to be solved to achieve that. But I think the industry is working very hard to do that, and so, yes. Oh, would, you, would you like to go yeah. on? Yes, I believe it can also be done, but it has to be done sustainably. So some of the challenges that are being addressed today will have to be addressed tomorrow in order to meet this growth. Thank you. And Steve? Uh, first point here is that the industry have been talking about 200,000 tonnes for 15 years now and haven't got there yet. Uh, they would have expected to have got there long before if you go back uh, even, even 10 years. Uh, our, our analysis, um, based on um, an, all, all the different work that we did, was that a 50% growth was much more likely than 100% growth. Um, in other words, getting more like 300,000 tonnes if everything is favourable, 
them getting to 400,000, that, that seems to us to be uh, hugely uh, probably over-optimistic. But in relation to achieving that, um, the majority of it probably is going to have to be from developing sites further offshore, um, which have got larger, can, can, can um, get larger volumes. Now, if technology uh, moves in, into that and enables that to happen, that could generate a lot of um, additional farms in, in these more offshore areas, and that could get us to that target. The other thing that is, is of interest, I think, there in relation to a number of the, the points that have been raised today is that if those sites become much more economic, there'll be less need to continue to operate in some of the more onshore sites, uh, um, and inshore sites, as it were, which are unpopular in communities, and one could see more of these sites um, closing, because some of these sites have closed already in the last 10 years, because if, if, if technology and economics work, the majority of, the, uh, of this production is going to be further offshore. So I think a lot of the issues that have been discussed will kind of fade away a bit because you've got this different scenario. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank you individually, Paul, James, Harvard, and, and Steve, for your, for your evidence today. It's been extremely useful, very detailed, um, and uh, I appreciate your succinct answers as the end as we became pressured for time. But thank you very much, and I'd now like to... Uh, close the meeting as that concludes committee business today. Thank you.